Laura, would you please call the roll? Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Sarah. Here. Councilor Maori. Here. Councilor Thorpe. Here. Okay, we are convened. Uh, first off, let me uh, notify folks that we are recording this audio and video. And that's for purposes of informed consent. If you want to testify and do not want to be on camera, written testimony is perfectly appropriate and it will be included in the record. Um, normally at this point we also have public comment, but I suspect that most folks are here and interested in speaking to a specific issue within the context of a hearing. If there's anyone who just wants general, to make general remarks, now you can. I would like you to limit your comments to three minutes. Um, as you step up, please identify yourself and tell us what city or town you're from. We don't need to know your street address or anything of that sort. So is there anyone interested who just wants to speak in general, generally remark on things? And Claudia, I see you looking like you want to get ready. So I'm, I'm putting my knitting down. Oh, well that's a sign right there. Yeah, thanks. Claudia left go, Ward 3. I want to make a, a few general comments because in Ward 3 we've had a lot of zoning issues and we've been to a lot of zoning meetings and we've lost a lot of zoning cases. And can you identify yourself and where you're from first? Northampton. Ward 3, Northampton. Yes, right. Right. <laughs> well, I, Sorry. thank you. Sorry. Um, so I think one of the issues that concerns us always is that the fact that the infill policy that the city has adopted has a possibility to change the character of the city. It changes the character of the neighborhoods. And so people who choose to live in a sort of semi-rural community find themselves instead in a dense, more urban, like my neighborhood is already dense in Ward 3, but now we have, we're having more density and it feels more urban because we have that new uh, lumberyard project, we have the, uh, what do you call it, the other one that's going on. We have a number of urban projects. And I don't think somehow that this occurs to people, that, that we live in a certain place because of the, 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 of the nature of the place and that it's changing in front of our eyes. So it's not always bad to have change, but what, you know, how do we accommodate that? For me personally, I was against the lumber yard. I thought I didn't want the lumber yard to happen because I thought it was going to really have a terrible impact. The truth is, it's a very mixed housing, mixed use housing project, and I would now say that I was maybe wrong to like argue against the lumber yard because it's it's brought a whole new dynamic. Uh, it, it's brought diversity to our neighborhood. We see a lot of different people using our area differently. So maybe it's okay. I'm going to say maybe it's okay. But the projects often that are coming into town, like the one that's now being proposed on Pomeroy, so forth, it's upscale. We're bringing more people who can afford to live in Northampton already to the, to, to the city. So I would say that projects, for me personally as a city resident, that specifically address in a big way diversity and affordable housing, I, I think we should have those. And I'll be quick. And then my last thing has to do with the infrastructure. So as we bring more and more people to town, the infrastructure is crumbling underneath us. So I come on my bike over all these potholes. I walk from my house, which isn't very far away, to downtown, and the sidewalks are crumbling underneath. People are tripping and falling. You can't build more housing and bring more people into the city unless we have a plan, I think, to address the in infrastructure problems. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else who wants to speak more generally? And Amy, I, I don't know if you were here when we said just identify yourself. Yeah, sure. Okay. Amy Ben Ezra in Northampton. Got that? That works. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, I um, I don't have a problem with infill. I've told people before I came from a place where there was a thousand apartments in a square block, and I loved it. And that's not the issue for me. For me, the issue is the compatibility of the size of a project to the space and what's around it. And that I want the city to be thinking about, as a previous speaker said, affordability, need-based. Is it because we need senior housing? Is it because we need um, housing for disabled people? Truly affordable. The young people that work in this city can't afford to live here, um, but they don't all qualify for subsidized housing. 
Um, that's what I want to see. I don't want to see more housing for wealthy people. I, there's plenty of that here. People can buy that. People can rent that. I don't understand that direction. And so that's an underpinning of my concern about the whole project, the whole effort, as well as in general the fact that my understanding, and this is before I lived here, though I've worked here for 13 years, the portrayals of sustainable Northampton and what kind of additional um, building on these kind of lots is going to occur, talked a lot about um, accessory apartments and other small one and two, and then the projects we're seeing or hearing about now that are being actually proposed are 10 units and 15 units and so forth. That's very different than what people understood it was about and supported and encouraged our council to support. So it feels a little bit of, dare I say, a bait and switch, and um, is very concerning. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> By the way, folks who have spoken now, you're not precluded from also testifying in the hearings, just so you know. Anyone else want to speak generally? <coughs> okay, so um, I would accept a motion to reopen the continued hearing of uh, our last meeting, which is on, uh, uh, what was the date? That was February 3rd? Is that right? No, that was when it was published. So uh, it was a continuation from February 10th. So that's on item 19.173 in ordinance to allow a change. <laughs> Another without a finding. Is there a motion to open here? Is there a second? All those in favor of opening the public hearing, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. And no abstentions. If I do the math right. All right. So where we left it last time is that um, actually there was a council request. Um, the councilors were concerned that they needed more information before we went into deliberation or were reluctant to close the hearing. Um, create the, and, and moving too fast as the caution was made from the audience. Um, I do know that there are people queued up. I don't. Is there a sign up list? Or is it? I did. It's on it's, the table. We'll do it. We'll do it old school wise. Um, first off, uh, I would ask Carolyn Mish as the proponent to step up and. There is a memo that she's, he's, she's provided in response to some of the points brought up uh, at the last hearing. So in, in our process, we introduce the proponents and then opponents and, or people with other questions can follow. So, Carolyn? Um, I'm not sure how you, um, you know, I don't have a presentation per right. se because I gave a presentation at the last hearing. Um, but um, I certainly uh, would be happy to answer questions um, that you might have, or if you have questions related to, um, you know, I presented to you all a memo just sort of capturing um, a lot of the essence of the comments from the last hearing and trying to sort of provide some additional um, feedback on those. Um, and so, I don't, you know, if you well, actually, where well, we left last time with some, uh, uh, I know Councilor Thorpe in particular had questions. So why don't we start with you, Councilor Thorpe, and your questions were relative. We, the concern was, of course, having conversations, not in the public venue. So the purpose of this hearing and this continuation was to conduct the, the discussion, the further discussion in public. Thank so, you. Councilor Thorpe, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Carolyn, for being here today. What, in regards to this ordinance, what, would this remove an all permit review? Or would all, you know, regarding, or will permits be in place? I mean, will this still be reviewed, you know? Um, so the way the ordinance is, um, um, currently written, um, if there's a proposed change of use that, that um, on a non-conforming lot, um, that because of the change of use uh, requires by zoning 
uh, let's say additional parking or even additional lot size, um, even if the project can um, support that additional parking, um, the current ordinance says you can't move forward with any project. So right now there's no way to change a use on a property that might be to a use that requires more parking, for example. The proposed change is to eliminate the language with, um, of that prohibition and let these projects move forward under an allowance, uh, you know, noting that there are a non-conforming, um, there's something non-conforming about the parcel. Uh, however, it doesn't address any other requirements that lie in other parts of the zoning. So it, um, there are many factors that trigger other reviews, mostly by the planning board. Uh, sometimes other non-conformities that would be triggered by the zoning board, but none of those are being proposed to be changed. So any new construction for something that's other than a single family home of 2,000 square feet or more would trigger a planning board review, for example. They look at the site plan and analyze um, elements of uh, the site under the jurisdiction of site plan. Um, and likewise, if something about the project triggers a special permit, that's still in place um, under planning board review. And I see that um there was an alternative to um, this ordinance that was presented uh, to possibly require a finding with, a, with detailed review criteria for the Zoning Board of Appeals for parcels that do not otherwise trigger a planning board review. Right. So another way to um, um, keep some review by the Zoning Board is to, for those projects that might not trigger a planning board review, um, or some other permit um, that the project could go to the zoning board for what we determine, what we call a finding, which is a determination that a project isn't substantially more detrimental to a neighborhood than the existing use on the non-conforming parcel. Um, so that um, you know, you could do that. Um, you could also um, maintain a zoning board review for um, projects that also require planning board review, but um, you start to get into sort of overlapping issues that both boards would be looking at, and it's not clear that there's um, uh, a fine distinction about um, you know who has jurisdiction to look at what elements, such as tree <coughs> replacement and mitigation, traffic mitigation, lighting, um, those kinds of things that are the planning board always looks at in a, in a site plan review uh, context. Okay. Now, not all zoning districts in the city allow the same type of unit of density, and uh, zoning allows different densities based on proximity to commercial centers. Can yeah. you give me an example? Sure. So we have um, what we call, um, so we have uh, business districts that allow um, commercial uses or a mix of commercial and residential uses. So downtown um, is located in what we refer to as the central business district. We also have a general business district which um, um, ha is in areas outside of downtown, up King Street a bit, out in uh, Florence Center's general business district. We have a couple of places where we have general business districts elsewhere. We also have industrial districts. Um, in re for residential districts, we have um, urban residential A, urban residential B, and urban residential C. Those are our core neighborhood districts, I would say, meaning they're mostly around the downtown area or around Florence Center and, and between Northampton and Florence. Um, and those have different levels of allowances for the types of units that are allowed. So in urban residential C, which is immediately around um, Central Business District in downtown, in fact, is only around downtown Northampton. It's not anywhere around um, Florence Center. Um, that allows the highest density um, with residential development. Residential, urban residential B is sort of the next layer or next tier between C and Florence Center and around downtown beyond that. So, um, you know, going out to Outbridge um, Street is urban residential B beyond the cemetery and then going up to Florence Center. And that's a lower, that allows lower level density. So single um, 
family, two, three family units. And then with um, permitting from the planning board, you can have more than more units than that, but not sort of the multi-family mid-rise kind of or uh, mid-rise residential that you can have with URC. And then URA simply right now only allows single-family homes. Um, we do have residential districts beyond that that um, go sort of further west. So we have suburban residential, rural residential, and water supply protection, which also allows single-family homes. Those three districts are really strictly single-family um, lot um, uh, provisions or allowances. Can you tell me how this would impact the sustainable Northampton plan? Pardon me? Um, so the, how this would uh, affect the sustainable Northampton plan is um, that we feel that it's consistent with the changes that we've made in the zoning over time uh, to implement that plan. And the reason for that is that we've created very um, detailed development standards based on a lot of public input from both the planning process and then post planning in um, we had several committees working on specific zoning strategies to help implement the plan to allow more flexibility in the type of development, particularly relative to housing, um, in the neighborhoods that are sort of surround downtown Florence, downtown and Florence Center, and for the purposes of trying to um, create um, housing um, supply in areas we know where there's demand and also we know we are sufficient in housing units and they're accessible via um, walking or biking um, or short short distances so because we've been um, developing these um, standards uh, focused on those urban residential b and c districts um, and to some degree urban residential a um, those are in those core neighborhoods where we have um, more non-conforming lots than in the outlying areas where lots were built out later in time. Um, so the fact that um, some of those non-conforming lots are right where we're trying to encourage residential development um, and then get tripped up against this um, prohibition of development um, to us signals that we need to really make those things consistent and not in conflict. And is it fair to say that prior to 1975, any lot here in the city could have been considered not conforming? Uh, prior to 1975, mm -hmm. um, well, there were certainly. I mean, we had quite. A, we had a lot of develop. Mm -hmm. The city was um, settled and developed um, extensively in you know between here and sort of west of Florence a bit um, through the 70s. So. Um, uh, and those lots, to a large extent, were created um, at different times that had that didn't have the same standards that we had starting in 1975. Thank you. Councilor I just kind of wanted to leap off of, of uh, Councilor Thorpe's first uh, question about moving forward if we make this, the changes uh, and amend the zoning uh, mm -hmm. ordinance. What would the specific project that I think a lot of the residents here are concerned about? I know the developer has withdrawn without prejudice. Right. Uh, so if that developer comes back, what would that look like? It's it's um, it sounds like there's going to be a, will the process start all over again? Or tell us more about yes. that because he did not finish the planning board process. Right. Correct. But you, why don't you just yes. kind of uh, make a visual for me about how that looks? Sure. So and this would be so any project that's starting out new today or is sort of a revision of something that didn't um, get off the ground previously, an applicant would come forward and um, uh, present an application to the building department. And uh, as with any project, we review it to see what permit path is available to um, allow that project to go forward. Sometimes there's not a permit path. If the council were to adopt a, a, a change, um, and as presented, it's that um, we would look at um, a non-conforming lot and say, well, it's non-conforming, but under the rules that were just adopted, um, the size of the project means it goes to the planning board. If you amend the ordinance and, and still keep 
a zoning board path as part of the project, then we would look at a project um, like the one in the court or any other one that triggers a uh, planning board review and say, well, it needs zoning board review and it needs planning board review. And I'll, and that would just start anew again. Even with the same developer? The yeah, same or any other project, any other developer. Okay. Yeah. No, thank you. Yep. Fun council share. Um, could you just kind of go bigger picture and um, maybe briefly tell us the different jurisdiction of the DBA versus planning board or sort of what what those different bodies <coughs> handle? Sure. So for the most part, um, uh, the zoning board um, reviews projects that fall under the section 9.3 of non-performing um, uses. So, it's um, four or five pages worth of description about non-conformities. So um, some of the non-conforming situations are allowed to move forward by, um, by right. Other ones require zoning board review. So for example, if a, a house sits on a property and it's too close to the property line for today's standards, so it violates what we refer to as a, a required setback, um, changes to that structure um, in under certain circumstances would require a zoning board review. So the zoning board looks at the change in that structure and how it relates to other properties in the neighborhood and whether that change is um, more, it, again, the standard is substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing condition. And typically what, um, for structural changes like that, um, they're looking at the facades to see, you know, where the living space or commercial space is being expanded, and are there ways to mitigate that with, if necessary, with um, landscaping or other tools. Um, and so there is very project specific. It's it's almost even site specific in terms of even the side of the site um, and how it impacts um, uh, the overall neighborhood in the review. Um, and the zoning board also reviews, so outside of those development projects, the zoning board has limited special permit review also for signs um, in the city. So any commercial or um, residential sign application that triggers special permit, it goes to the zoning board. Um, they do very little review of site plan um, technical details. So the planning board's jurisdiction is really about how a project functions on the site. How does um, the traffic on the site maneuver, how do, um, how do, how do any structures fit on the site in relation to that um, transportation movement, um, what, um, how is the site landscape, what kinds of lighting are, are, is proposed on the property. Um, and there are a lot of requirements in the zoning that dictate what's allowed as it relates to the um, light levels, to um, traffic mitigation, to tree replacement, to uh, you know open space location and functionality. Um, so a lot of site details. I will say the zoning board does um, <coughs> look at lighting um, for a site when they're when um, a project comes into their review, but they really are going back and balancing that against the zoning ordinance. So they're not just evaluating lighting and vacuum. They're just focusing on what the standard in the zoning is, and if the project meets that standard, then they're going to approve it. Um, planning board has more flexibility to, to sort of look at that design and see if there are ways that those lighting standards can be, or those lighting, proposed lighting might be changed, or um, maybe there are different ways to address lighting on the site to help um, offset some of the issues that might arise in a given project. So they're definitely, you know, I think broadly the planning board really looks at the whole, to the totality of the function of a site. I just had a follow -up sure. Quick sure. question. So with the site plan review, is there a public hearing component to that? Yes. So uh, public hearing is, is um, we have the same public hearing standards for any kind of permit path that we have under the zoning. Um, um, 
anyone in the audience now uh, wishes to speak uh, for or again? There actually are there proponents or someone willing to speak in favor? Anyone speaking in opposition, please? Council. Hello, uh, Attorney John McLaughlin of Northampton. I was here before, <coughs> if you may recall. Uh, I represent Mr. Mogio, and uh, he's the support of many of his neighbors um, on Dewey Court. I'm not going to speak to the specifics of Dewey Court, but uh, they are very much in opposition to the change of the existing um, ordinance pertaining to filing. And since we've started this, there's more and more people who are also in opposition to changing the, the law at this point. Um, I, would, I do want to get into something. I've given you some handouts. Um, because I think there's like a 500 pound gorilla in the room that we're not talking about is, you know, the city says, oh, don't worry, you don't need the finding because you're gonna have site plan review for, for the smaller projects and you're gonna have special permit uh, for the bigger projects. So if somebody has, had, has a horrible lot with no frontage at all whatsoever that you can never build on if you're willing to build on it, because you had a single family house on that for years, they're now, they'll now want to build a 30 unit apartment building in there. Um, don't worry, that'll be done with inside plan review or a uh, special permit. The problem that we see with that is some of the definitional sections of the existing bylaws. When I said before, I said the problem is we don't want to get stuck with those ordinances, excuse me. The city defines a dwelling unit to include a kitchen. Okay, meaning, um, Little units, little apartments that don't have kitchens aren't really apartments, okay? But what it really matters now is co-living, what is known as co-living. And this was some part of the uh, elements of Undoing Court, where someone would put a little <coughs> living unit, which is a full bathroom and a bedroom, locked, rented, separate lease, separate tenancy, and it's a, it shares a kitchen. And you put one, two, three, four, you put up five, six, you put a bunch of them sharing a kitchen, okay? Now, with your zoning regulations, it says the most parking you ever need is two per unit. Okay? So that means if there were six of these co-living um, units that shared one kitchen, okay, the city would say, all you need is two parking spaces. That's it. Even though, in reality, you could end up with 12 parking spaces from six of these units. That is really part of the problem here. <laughs> and we don't want to get rid of the finding until maybe there's some more comprehensive thought and understanding and some discussion pertaining to the definition of housing units. I mean, I believe these definitions are from the 70s when there was a nuclear family more common, where there might have been a mother and a father and a couple kids in a multi-bedroom apartment. Maybe you never needed more than two cars. But that's not the case now, especially with the co-living. With the co-living, you can pretty much count on almost every bedroom having a car. I know the city also wants to say, oh, well, you know, we're doing this uh, because they can use uh, public transportation. I actually commute on the bike uh, in the summer and ride the bike or take the bus back. Very few people do that. It's not happening. I'm by myself most of the time doing such a thing. It's not happening yet. There's not 24-7 bus. There's no T like Southie. So really, people have cars. They need cars to get to work. They need cars to go uh, to get groceries. Most people have cars. So they're saying, OK, well, maybe we're underestimating uh, the amount of parking. We're doing that so that we're uh, lowering the carbon footprint. But that's not at all what's happening. It's getting much worse. What's happening is a building will come in and build a huge building and not enough parking. Do people um, not use cars? No. So you're not removing the carbon footprint. You're moving it from what should be a developer's parking lot and onto the city streets to the severe detriment of the people who live in the city. Whether they rent or own, whoever lives in that street is in big trouble because they're going to have trouble parking, they're going to have trouble driving. Um, so the real problem that I see it is your parking rates. And if you, you look, um, there's even... I don't know, maybe Al can talk to this. It seems like there's some kind of anomaly between some of the parking rates, even. In the, in the general provisions of the ordinances, it talks about minimum parking being 500 square foot. 
but in many of the ordinances pertaining to each chapter, it talks about 1,000 per, per square foot, but in both of them say, but no more than two spaces per dwelling. How do those things intermesh? I would refer to our planner. <laughs> I haven't studied this. And actually, Councilor, can I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, yes. You're making a case for uh, predicated on the parking concerns, and I understand that. Yes. Retaining the Zoning Board of Appeals as, as an avenue, how do you how do you expect that that would allow you uh, the protection that you think? You yes, Mr. Chairman, it's precisely this way. Right now, the city says, oh, don't worry about everything. We'll take care of it with special permit or site plan review. But we know that that's going to be terrible. Because if somebody has a little lot that's has had one family house on it for years, it's a lot that nobody could ever build on. If I brought that to, to the planning board to subdivide it, they'd say, no, you have no frontage. It's a terrible lot. And, and when you have no frontage, it's a real detriment. You, you won't be able to have access. You will never be able to do streetscape design, which the city says it likes. Okay? So, so we're left with a finding. With a finding, I can go to the planning board and say, okay, this is a terrible lot. Nobody should have built on it, but they've been using it for years for a house. And it doesn't really bother the neighborhood that much. Now, you want to put in a 30-unit apartment building there. I say 30 units. It's 30 separate co-living spaces. So, but um, that's what they're putting in there. That's going to be horrible for traffic. It's going to be horrible for parking. No, I, I copy all that, and I've got that part. But the Zoning Board of Appeals, of course, refers to they are going to make their decisions predicated on the rules as they say. Right, and those rules, right. those so rules are fine. Is, as you, is, what you just described, the rules is flawed. No, no, no. It's, it's not. The, the, the finding is fine. Please understand, we want you to keep the finding. My, pe my people need the finding, otherwise they're suffering from the planning board's regulations. Because the planning board has parking regulations that are from the 1950s or the 1960s. The, the city has regulations. The city. The city. Right. Let's the be city. clear. Let's be really clear on our terms here. All right, the, city. The, the city has regulations. The planning board doesn't have their separate regulations. True. So, and the zoning board of appeal reviews the same regulations when they make, when they render their decision. Right? Well, yes, but oh, I, mean, I'll, 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 this, this I, I think that there's just a disconnect here. The intent of a finding is just a very cursory look at a particular use existing and a particular use proposed. It does not get into where the parking spaces are, right. who's doing what, where. It's a very generic look at this. If it's a large project, it is then going to go to the planning board for a very microscopic look. The granular. More granular, granular review. And so that's where the issue of whether there is adequate access is going to happen. That's going to be the, the traffic is going to be reviewed in great detail. The finding doesn't do that. It is a generic cursory review of whether it, there is substantially more detriment to the neighborhood. Not that access is adequate or that it's compatible with the neighborhood, which are all the kinds of things you see in a special permit. You won't see that in a finding. Okay? So uh, I, I just think that, uh, with all due respect, uh, Attorney McLaughlin, complaining more about the very specific requirements under the ordinance for development than he is about the, the removal of a, the necessity of a finding in favor of a much more detailed look by the planning board. Um, the same two units, two cars per unit, if that's what's required, is, are going to be in place whether it's a finding or a special permit. Yeah. Brother Council is right. We're not in disagreement as to the interrelationship between finding and special permit. What I'm saying is that if we have, with the finding, my clients and all the citizens in whatever street they live in need the finding. Because what the zoning board can do is look at, ask the developer, okay, what's been happening there so far? And let's say it's a one family, a two family house. Okay, very little parking, very little traffic. I understand there's a lot you shouldn't fill down in the first place, but the city's letting you stay there. Now the developer comes into a lot that he shouldn't build on in the first place and wants to put in 30 units. The traffic's going to be horrible, the parking's going to be horrendous, and the zoning board can say, no, we don't want you to do this. This is going to be more substantially detrimental to the neighborhood. Take that away. And then all you have is the developer going there, as of right now, to build on a horrible lot. 
a big new department complex, and you'll be doing the planning board with the regs for parking that are horrendous. So I'm saying you should not change this finding unless you also start looking at your parking regulations. Because it's delusional to think that people are not parking. Uh, my office is on Pleasant Street, okay? 155, after that was built, I used to be able to tell people, come to my office at night and park on the street. Not anymore. Doesn't happen. Because people park on the street now. The developers build and leave, and the parking doesn't, they're not getting rid of parking, they're moving into the street to the detriment of everybody. That's what's going on. And if people aren't certain that that's what's going on, then you should have comprehensive rezoning thoughts, and meetings, public hearings, to deal with these issues, to just get rid of a, a fining statute that all the other cities and towns have. Because you're, because, well, I know it's not pretending, it pertains to more to the Dewey Court, but that's what brought it about. So I brought a lawsuit saying this is wrong, and it is wrong. That you can't, you've got to be able to look at the past use of bad lot, that's what I'm going to call it, bad lot, compared to the new use that somebody wants to do in a bad lot. And that's what the zoning finding is about. If you get rid of it, then you're leaving them to the detriment of, of the citizens, to the, to the system that's with the planning board. And the planning board is stuck with regulations such that a developer could come in and say, before the planning board, I'm giving you all the parking I have to give you. So, you, you know, it has a good chance of getting this permit. Now, you know, you could argue against that, but with this planning board, he's got a good chance of getting that permit. If he shows that he's hit his minimums. But those minimums are going to be horrendous for the neighborhood. Because people are still going to get cars, they're still going to park, and it's going to be done on the streets. But if I have a finding that says, you can't build it at all, just go away, because it's going to be substantially more detrimental. That's what my clients need. That's what everybody who lives next to a non-conforming <coughs> lot needs. And that's what every other city in town has. It's almost like rewarding somebody for having a lot that the city was nice enough to let them use. You know, they've got a bad lot. The city let them keep a single family home there for years under non-conforming grandfathered rights. And now they come in and say, thank you for letting me have that house on the lot that was terrible. I want to put a 30-year apartment building there. And I want it to be governed by parking for regulations from the 50s or 70s, which are totally out of date. And the neighborhood suffers. That's essentially it. Thank you. Um, anyone else would like to speak? Is your hand up? I can't tell. Amy? Um, Amy Benz, I'm with Nancy. Uh, first, I want to say this whole issue of zoning, special permitting, whatever, is extremely, extremely complicated. It's an enormous learning curve. I have spent dozens and dozens of hours, as have my neighbors and other people in the community, trying to understand this, trying to follow the rules, etc. I have concerns because I think that perhaps the members of the zoning board and the members of the planning board, as well intended as they are and the fact that they're giving them their time, I don't know that they put in as much time learning this stuff as we have, or anything near it. I do know that they don't get any training. They don't get any training in what is what are the issues around traffic or traffic safety at an intersection. They don't get training about um, drainage issues. I mean, there's so many things that we've had to study, wetlands, I mean, all kinds of things in order to be able to understand the positive and negative consequences of a given development. Um, so that's very concerning to me. The other thing that's very concerning to me is having been sat through the special permitting process for particularly the project that's on the uh, and I don't know how many of you were part of sitting in those meetings, but um, the special permitting pro process is very subjective. It is guidelines, there's the seven points, or whatever they're called. Frontage is a law. Frontage stops if you either you follow the law or you don't follow the law. The special permitting process as, process as it exists right now, the way it's written, is very vague, it's very subjective, and it lends itself 
to being um, ma manipulated, shall I say. And that the members of the um, board that are there, because they, I think they all want to do the right thing, whatever that might be. But if you have limited training and understanding of the issues and you're sitting there going like, what is this, what is that, which is what we see in these meetings, and I don't mean to be denigrating of anyone who is there on those courts, then that what they are left with is to turn to the one person who's sitting at the table there, who doesn't have a vote, but who is the employee of the city, in this case, Carolyn Mish, for advice. And what it seems to me is that essentially they vote pretty much what she advises. <coughs> and that means that the person, the one person who's not an elected person there, who's not, I mean, she's an employee, has seven votes. And the other people are doing their best, but for the most part, they don't know enough to make a really informed choice. The other thing about that experience was that people already had their minds made up before the hearing began. The chair sat in the meeting and said outright that she supported this and we should do this. I mean, she supported the developer's plan and we should do it. So the fact that we were there as a community presenting other information, other points of view, etc., to influence our a sub-sector of our elected officials, it was already a done deal. In essence, I mean, maybe there'd be a little tweaking here and there, but for the most part, it was a done deal. That doesn't feel very democratic to me. It doesn't feel respectful. It didn't feel respectful when people sat there and rolled their eyes and went like this and, you know, looked funny at us. Or, and it didn't feel respectful when somebody, when we talked about our traffic concerns and the fact that we're on an intersection that is really close to where people happen to go down the hill really fast and come around the curve on a light thinking they're going to go straight, not expecting someone to turn left because you can't even see that street. It's sort of hidden, the entry is somewhat hidden. We're told, well, you're already an F in terms of traffic safety, safety. So what does it matter? You can be an F minus. I mean, give me a break. That did not, there was no, um, and there was also a, not necessarily from the board. I don't know. I can't remember anywhere where it came from. But an, an attitude of that we were against infill, that we were against density, and that we would, we were a bunch of enemies. Anybody who knows me knows better than that. And so that feels very, like, throw out that little red herring or whatever, and you can dismiss these people even further. At this point, all we, that's left for not, all these non-conforming lots who are going to face in different ways, not only different issues that come up, there's a lot of them that are wetlands that I'm knowing about, and I'm real concerned about that. We have climate change. It's getting warmer. We're getting more rain, heavier rain. Where is all that water going to go? We have a really decayed infrastructure. And we're talking about building a lot more, and the buildings themselves prevent big rain. Um, we're talking about putting more cars on the street. And I, I would dare ask, of everybody who's here, how many people live in downtown, in the so-called walkable part of downtown? <laughs> Everybody who does not own a car, of all of you, did you I, drop your hands? For, for the hearing, I I'm not allowed to do that. Okay, sorry. How many of you don't have cars and live in downtown? We ha people have cars, and the newcomers will have cars. I'm not in favor of cars. I'm in favor of more trans public transportation. But until we actually have more public transportation to offer people, and that goes places other than downtown North Hampton and downtown Amherst, but people work other places, they are going to have cars. So then the responsibility ends up, and I just, I moved here from Amherst, okay? So I've seen these developments happen. I've also seen developers build things downtown and say, we don't need to provide parking because people aren't going to need cars because they're right here downtown and it's supposed to be mass in the bus. They all have cars and they're all on the street. Fine. But what's going to happen is that there isn't enough room on the street. People are already circling 15 minutes, 30 minutes. I've heard people tell me they circle 45 minutes looking for a parking space on a particular you know, night or whatever. I don't know what, with what frequency. Um, we're going to end up having to build more parking lots that are going to be city parking lots that we as taxpayers will pay for because we're not demanding that the developers put it on their tab to provide 
the parking or to extend the frontage, which is where this frontage piece in part comes from. If this developer had extended his frontage by building the road into his property, he would have had his 50 feet. He might not have been able to build as big a project as he liked, but he would have met the frontage rules. And we wouldn't, I mean, and plus the cityscape and all that other stuff was potentially bigger. Um, so I really feel at this point like this frontage issue, rightly or wrongly, just like it's been being questioned now in reaction to, in the moment, the Dewey Court situation, we have the same right to say we want to hold on to it in relationship to that situation and other situations that are spilling through the city while the city addresses some of these other issues, including training your own committee people so that they can feel comfortable with the votes that they take and feel informed and feel like they're contributing in a meaningful way and not feeling like, oh God, I don't really understand what's going on here, which we have seen. Um, so that's very disturbing. The other piece I want to talk about related to this is that, as I start, said I think a little bit earlier, the special permit process with these seven points, it's very subjective. So you get a whole bunch of people say, there's a real serious traffic issue. We turn on the street, we see people almost have accidents, whatever, and the committee says, that's not true. We say, there's a, you know, a, this little sort of cul-de-sac entrance, which we have seen delivery trucks try to use the turnaround on our dead end street and get stuck and take 15 minutes to get out. But we're told, oh no, the fire department says it'll be fine. We don't know that they ever sent a fire truck there to test it, but we're told that that, that will be fine. Um, we talk about the wetlands, we're told that's fine. We talk about something else, we're told it's fine. I'm not feeling really um, a lot of reassurance in the using the special permit process as this thing that's going to be there for us when we get rid of the frontage issue because it is so arbitrary and it can be so easily influenced. And if there were more clear... Uh, regulations or specifications within the special permitting process that make that made it less subjective. Then I might have more confidence in that process and not feel like we need to have frontage rules in the same way. Because I agree, if you have two or three houses on a on a acre lot, I mean, we can figure that out. So I'm asking. What I'm asking is that this whole issue of getting rid of the frontage thing ordinance. You just slow down. It's been there for a long time. People have been doing their auxiliary apartments just fine for a long time. Don't be paying and complain because we were breaking the rules. Um, leave it there for a while while the city and other people and I'm willing to step up and be part of it and serve on a committee if anybody wants me to look at these issues and see how else can we create part of it so that it serves our purposes so that it is based on regs and not so much on arbitrary um, <coughs> opinions. And um, that, because once we, a developer builds something on a lot, it's there. We can spend the next five years discussing other ways to do permitting, but if we've already let them put this, you know, some big building there, it's done. Nobody's going to come back to them and say, you need to take it down. We, you know, we made a mistake. I would like to avoid those mistakes. Um, and I really am asking, to slow the whole thing down, the world will not come to an end if this does not get voted on to remove it now. And to really look carefully at all of these issues, including the issues of where were all the waters and go. You know, I mean, I some people, you know, there's sort of the, the common so-called knowledge is that, you know, we need much more housing because we don't have enough housing. I don't know if that's changed since 2014 or whenever the last you know, review on that was put forward. I see lots and lots of condos that are languishing, not being sold. I see lots of apartments on listings that are there for months and months and months. So I'm not sure that there's quite the crisis of housing that would require that we so urgently change this because we need to get housing and that's the number one priority. So those are my concerns and I really beg you to slow this down and really do the homework that it requires for the long run benefit of the city. And I would be the first one to support appropriate 
lots of fruit that have dense houses, because that's what I want. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're almost 6 o'clock, so let me just point out that there are, we do have four hearings. This is a continuation of an existing hearing. Does anyone have new testimony that has not been shared with us, some new information that we have not had an opportunity to hear since the last meeting in this meeting? Try them all. I'm going to be quick. I just want to ditto everything that she said. Uh, and I just want to let you know by, you know, the ordinance the way it is now, it doesn't work for the city. I understand that. But there can be variables to it. And I really hope that the city does a good job in coming up with some variations to it. Um, and what you see here, we've been referring to this whole Dewey Court thing, which brought this up. But this is going to be happening more and more and more with projects and developments in town that people are going to be frustrated with special permitting and whatnot, and this is the future of what's going to happen if this ordinance isn't worded properly and if the ZBA goes away completely. So that ZBA, having that layer in there, uh, shouldn't necessarily just be cleaned up. Uh, I think you really need to really do some soul searching this thing, and parking creates traffic and vice versa. Parking is a huge issue. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, did you identify yourself for the record? Oh, so. Mark Mochi of Northampton Mass. Thank you. Anyone with new information, please? I'd ask for a, a motion to close the public hearing. Motion to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor of closing the public hearing, please say aye. 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 Um, procedurally, sometimes what we would do is go and make our recommendation to our debate afterwards, but actually about two-thirds of the audience sitting here is here for another hearing that concerns me, and uh, since, uh, as I said, we had five hearings, I'd like to move to those as fast as we can, uh, and then we'll, have, at the end, have an opportunity to deliberate and make our recommendations for each one, if everyone's comfortable with that. No. <laughs> Look, Continue the, it then, if you feel you have too much on your agenda. You, the fact is, is that I need to accommodate the other people in the hearings. You'll still be able to hear what our decision is in the end. And uh, so the opportunity to hear our deliberation and our discussion and our vote will still be present. It's just that let <laughs> everyone sitting in these uncomfortable seats. I don't want to punish some people more unfairly than others. And my apologies, and I'm sorry about this. Um, the next item up, this is a hearing for item 20.004. It's an ordinance to rezone nine Con Street parcels from NB, neighborhood business, to CB, central business. Um, I'll ask for a motion to open the public hearing, please. Second. All those in favor of opening the public hearing, please say aye. 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 We are convened. I, I see Councilor Etheridge hovering at the door, ready to go. And I, I don't know. Uh, first of all, Carolyn, would you would you uh, lay out the ground for this? Sure. There are two different. Oh, and I I'm sorry, I did hop right over. Um. Uh, well, we have opened this here. I'm sorry, I did skip one. Uh, Councilor, I will get to yours, I promise. How's that? We are in, currently convened in the public hearing on Con Street, the Con Street parcel. So, how long would you sure. present that? Yep. Um, so, the ordinance is dated March 8, 
and um, uh, as part of the package. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about that at the time. The, the way it went to public hearing in front of the planning board was not with um, um, an expansion of the central business architecture guidelines at that time. And uh, the planning board had a lot of discussion about whether or not it was appropriate to separate the design guidelines from central business previously. Anytime we made it, um, an expansion of the central business district boundaries, uh, we also made a parallel uh, recommendation for amendment of the central business architecture guidelines map um, so that they would be the same district and that meant that um, design criteria related to new projects or renovations, exterior renovations of buildings would um, uh, be reviewed through the lens of those um, architectural guidelines, either at the staff level or um, at the at a public hearing level in front of the architectural committee. Um, so the planning board actually recommended, because that wasn't coming together, they recommended not to move the zoning forward because the central business architecture guidelines work with it. So you have something else on your agenda tonight that is um, also a um, recommendation uh, from staff and it was posted on the agenda for um, hearing to discuss extending the architectural guidelines along with the zoning boundaries. But I just want to let you know that's why the planning board did not make a positive recommendation. Right, it's actually specified here. Yeah. So about the CBAC map. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, okay, thank you. Do you want to expand it? Yeah, so just another piece. So um, we, um, <coughs> on the heels of the adoption of um, a sustainable Northampton, there was a proposal to extend Central Coast Architecture down Con Street in these same locations, including that little yellow finger that's on, uh, farther up north on Con Street. And um, at the time, there was some concern by um, actually, I think, um, former Councillor Murphy about um, the Central Coast Architecture guidelines being appropriate for that section of Con Street. So at the time, uh, the zoning change just went as far as in the end of that yellow finger is actually Paradise Copies. And so at the time, we just extended some of this down to the edge of Paradise Copies and no further. So it is something that um, the city's been looking at for um, many years. So it's in that context that we have brought it forward now. Um, and also related to the fact that um, there's a use at the World War II Club that doesn't fit the make of a business district but would be allowed in central business. So that's why it's coming forward now as opposed to in several months where we're looking at rezoning the whole corridor. And that's it. Thank you. Um, other proponents? Speaking in favor? Um, we'll start from the far right and move our way forward. And that's you. And then uh, if you please step up and identify yourself and the town you're from. Well, my name is Kate Sadefsky. I'm from Northampton. Um, I, with three on others, own a house at 14 Fruit Street, the street that runs parallel with Tom Street. Um, I am less than a, a five minute walk from the World War II Club. Um, and that, uh, the location of the World War II Club was actually a very positive factor in our choice to buy a house there. Um, it was a space that we really loved and appreciated, and we found a spot um, that, was, that was for sale nearby. We were really, really excited about that. Um, I um, also want to point out that as a very uh, local person, I have never had any noise trouble from the existing um, from the existing activities there, and I am a librarian. <laughs> uh, I support the proposed zoning change to the parcels on Con Street. Uh, in particular, I feel like it allows the um, World War II Club to continue doing a really um, a really wonderful uh, a lot of really wonderful things. I've lived in Northampton for ten years. And I've been at a regular at uh, the World War II Club for Friday night karaoke for about at least the last five years. 
I tried to look it up, but I've honestly lost count. Um, there I found a really wonderful piece of community, as well as very positive catharsis of singing and dancing away a stressful work week. <laughs> Uh, my friends who have moved away know it's so special that they go out of their way to make sure that they structure their visits to include a Friday night at the Juice. And the place isn't just about routine either. The World War II Club consistently has gone above and beyond when it comes to being supportive of community in times of need. And it's allowed me to be more connected and civically engaged. In 2016, on approximately no notice, they donated space for a fundraiser immediately after the Pulse nightclub tragedy. They allowed, that allowed queer community to come together to dance, to mourn, and to send funds to survivors. In January 2017, it's where we made signs for the March on Washington. And in July 2018, it's where I saw my first live debate between candidates for my state representative. I could go on, but I think you get the idea. There's a lot going on there, and one of the, also what makes us so great is that it's a short walk away for me. It's important to me to try and find more and more things in my community that I can get to by bus or by walking as, as just an ongoing part of, 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 of improving uh, our environmental sustainability and improving my life in our community. Everything changes. That's a constant of the universe. I've spent months hoping for some way to keep the heart of this establishment alive. And after reading something about the proposed buyer's plans in the Gazette and hearing from some of the people who, uh, from some of the workers at the World War II Club, I really believe that this rezoning is the best answer. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, Sayla, Rockhampton. I am one of the co-owners, along with Kate Zdebski on Fruit Street. I wish to second what they've said in support of the World War II Club, and I'd like to add a few additional notes. As many of us are aware, the club is up for sale, and according to Friday's article in the Gazette, Signature Sound prospective purchasers intend to continue all these sorts of things that the club is doing, and to keep it as an entertainment venue and community center. Goals it already fulfills. I can't say for certain how well they'll succeed, no one can, but what I can say is without a purchaser, the club closes. All the good it did ends. And my property, my neighborhood, loses value because of that. As mentioned, the house I live in is a five minute walk from the club. I can't personally speak how loud, for how loud it gets to direct neighbors, but I can say I've never had a problem with noise carrying or with the behaviors of patrons after they've left. I'm honestly more inconvenienced by the senior center, which is not exactly a rocket venue. <laughs> I can also say that based on the records that I could look up, there have been no registered complaints for over a decade at the club, and none at all for the purchaser. Any claims otherwise are uninformed at best, and possibly slander at worst. <laughs> Finally, I can also say, as someone whose property, according to this map, abuts a central business zone on Con Street, I haven't encountered any wanton building out or unreasonable noise. It certainly sounds scary, changing a zone to allow things like retail, offices, bars, community centers, vet clinics, daycare, or residential use above the first floor, to get an exhaustive list. But central business zones, as evidence, are already part of the nature of the neighborhood. And as mentioned, the property in question behaves in a similar way already. This is not some sudden, drastic change to Con Street. I'm sure there are concerns about the zoning that can and should be addressed. I know I would support protections for the existing sidewalks, and clear ways of contacting the licensing commissions should problems arise. But unevidenced fears and pearl clutching should not be a reason to deny this rezoning, especially with all the good that would be done with it. I want to see the legacy of the World War II Club continue here, in my neighborhood, where it began. And supporting this rezoning is the best way to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Tell your hand, Amy, I can't yes. And then, and then I am Amy Kaling, Northampton. I am the executive director of the Downtown Northampton Association and wanted to speak in favor of this proposed 
zoning change, in part for sort of the emotional pull, and in part because as the executive director of the DNA, I hear with incredible frequency how there are so many um, empty storefronts downtown. Downtown is dying. All of the cool things are going to East Hampton, and everything is going to Greenfield. And I feel like with this zoning change, we're presented with an opportunity that I don't know will come along again to save this building to continue a use that it's doing right now and to prevent those cool things from going to North Hampton and to fill a storefront that could otherwise be vacant <coughs> in a zoning area that already has a significant business and commercial component. I'm certainly concerned about concerns around parking um, and development, but I think those concerns can be addressed on a project-by-project -project basis. And I would hate for the city to make a decision that would chase away this prospective purchaser by not approving this zoning um, zoning change and leaving us with another vacant storefront downtown or losing another um, well-trusted, well-known purchaser that's continuing the use of this property in the, in the way that it has been in the past. Thank you. Yes. Come on, Mr. Rupp. Hi, I'm Megan Zinn, Northampton. Um, and I'm here to support the zoning change, um, changes on Con Street that would allow Signature Sound to buy the World War II Club and operate it as a music venue. They have a very long track record, as we know, of providing diverse entertainment, the Green River Festival, the Back Porch Festival, the Parlor Room, Academy of Music, um, shows at those venues, and Gateway City Arts in Holyoke that enrich our communities while also being responsible to them. It will allow Northampton to preserve this great community center that might otherwise be vacant and continue to serve the veterans that it was created for. The benefits to the city outweigh the inconveniences and it seems unlikely to make a significant change to an area of town that already operates much like it is already part of the center of the city. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Good evening, Jennifer Derringer, Northampton. Um, this is a zoning change that essentially acknowledges the reality of the existing use of the parcel, namely the World War II Club, which has been a community space and entertainment venue for many, many years. These are exactly the kind of businesses that we should have in downtown. This is what brings Northampton its vibrancy. Um, we have the benefit tonight of not operating in a vacuum here. We know who the prospective buyers are. Um, we're lucky that they're interested in expanding their business in downtown Northampton rather than elsewhere in the valley. Jim and Peter operate the Corolla Room. There's not been a single noise complaint the entire time they've been there. Thank you for, uh, to Jim Nash for getting the information from the Licensing Commission. Um, they run a true community uh, space there. It offers space for so many community-based entities and nonprofits, local performances, comedies, uh, or comedy acts, um, uh, Young filmmakers, a weird crossword event last week, <coughs> which was really fun. Um, Safe Passage, the local battered women's program, has had many events there. Uh, Bridge Street School has also had many events there. The, um, the space has donated the, um, the venue to us, which has been wonderful for the school. Uh, the Makers mar mar Market takes place there. Local um, makers and uh, crafters use that space to sell their goods. And um, Jim and Peter also run incredibly responsible large-scale events. You all may have been to the Green River Festival. I myself was there last summer to hear Angela Kijo. She was the last act of the night. There were thousands of people having a great time and dancing. And all of a sudden, the music cut off. And I looked at my husband and I said, why did that happen? And he pointed over to Peter Hamlin and said, Peter, just cut it off. It's 11 o'clock, and that's when the music has to stop. And that's when the music stopped. And that's the kind of responsible ownership you're going to find with Jim and Peter. The Arcadia Folk Festival is another example of a wonderful event that they've put on the last couple of years. Um, there they've done really interesting and great things like a bike, ba uh, a bike ballet to encourage people to ride their bikes there. Um, many efforts to uh, compost and recycle rather than throwing things away. And also another opportunity to showcase both one of the ballet's jewels, Arcadia, as well as uh, local makers um, for a maker's market there. They will continue this kind of community engagement at the World War II Club. They will allow nonprofits who are already having events to continue to, continue to use the space, including the Council of Social Agency monthly meetings, and this is an organization on which I serve on the board. 
Peter and Jim are exactly the kind of folks that we want to be running these establishments in our community. They bring vibrancy to the community already with what they do. And um, they stand in real contrast to another option for our entertainment in the Valley. I think that's to be noted. Um, so I encourage you uh, to approve this one, Jim. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, any other comments? Steve? Hi, I'm Steve Carter from Northampton. Um, I'm also the current president of the World War II Veterans Association of Hampshire County. And I guess I want to let folks know that unfortunately we are not going to be able to keep control of the building as it stands at this time. Um, we have some debt issues, we have other things going on. And as we were getting more and more in debt and trying to figure out what we were going to do, the biggest heartache was what was going to happen to all the community involvement that happens in that building. And we were trying to keep that in mind as we put it up for sale and hoping that um, it would go to a use that would be beneficial for everyone. I unfortunately was unaware that it wasn't already zoned for what it was doing. We have gotten the entertainment license year after year. We've been doing all of the things that we were hoping to do. Um, the reality is, is that building was built because they had to expand from where they were, which was, it's hard to read the map, but it was right above the barber shop because I used to be on the Little League team. And so we'd go there for hot dogs and soda and chips after our games. And I just turned 60 years old. So I can tell you how long ago that was. And then in the early 70s, they moved down there and built that building. Um, it is a community place. I have done everything from having donation dinners, um, benefit dinners for after the fires happened uh, on Fair Street. I've done it for people with disabilities. I've actually raised over $10,000 to help two rock vets be able to relocate. All of that kind of stuff is supposed to continue in that space, allowing us to still be a community, still have veterans, things go on. Uh, I have somebody who's going to talk about it on Wednesdays, but I also want to say we have a monthly meeting there about VOICE, which is a veteran outreach and the community engagement. We pull in people from four counties. It's the most central place for us to meet. Peter has said that he wants us to keep using the day space to meet the needs of both the veterans. Our association is still going to be existing, the nonprofit, because we're an advocacy group for veterans. We don't have the money any longer to run the business, to run the building, to run a bar. But if, if we can have this zoning change, it's going to allow us to continue our work with the great generosity of them to continue our work through all, all kinds of venues and all kinds of events that have gone on there. So um, for me, it's about the veterans and making sure they, they have a gathering place and they have a space. By rezoning and allowing the sale to go through that's going to happen. Otherwise, it's going to be an empty space. Not sure what else we're going to be able to do with that space. And I worry about it just being an empty shell uh, on, a, on a downtown street. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Chris. Uh, my name is <coughs> Leverett, Massachusetts. I have to confess, so I'm the other okay. side of the river. We allow you over on the oh, side. Okay. <laughs> if you have a proper paper. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is actually relevant um, because uh, you your name, please? Do you Christopher please? Carlisle, okay. North Leverett, Massachusetts. Um, we began building, I'm the director of Building Bridges uh, Veterans Initiative. Um, we have now nine sites in Western Massachusetts and we're moving into New Hampshire and Boston. And the first site was at the Deuce uh, five years ago. And with the help of Steve, um, we got uh, what began as a not very popular initiative going and, uh, and had uh, enormous um, sort of interest all around the western part of the state. Um, we see in Northampton proper uh, 50 to 70 veterans every Wednesday for lunch. It's a venue for veterans 
uh, nonprofits and services to, to, to come and avail, uh, make available uh, services to veterans. Uh, and I, I do want to say beyond that, um, I, I ask myself the question all the time, could, could I have started uh, building bridges in Amherst? And I'm an Amherst guy and I grew up. And I don't know the answer to that, but it's not, uh, it's no sort of uh, surprise that in a town like Northampton, whose karma really <coughs> is extremely supportive of this, and also I've done, uh, I do uh, Cathedral in the Night, that, that there's something quite unique about Northampton that uh, I hope uh, you don't take for granted living here, because I certainly don't, and I would hope that um, the zoning could, be, could accommodate the continued use of, uh, uh, of the deuce um, because it really is our sort of flagship uh, community that continues to sort of telegraph on the state and beyond. So, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. <coughs> Uh, Christopher Bigelow, Northampton. I'll be pretty brief, uh, just because I know probably volume of music may be an issue that comes up. And uh, I'm the one who's been playing the high volume music <laughs> at the World War II Club for the past 15 years. Uh, the bulk of it, I mean, obviously there's use in the back room and other such stuff. Um, <clears throat> FYI, uh, the noise impact from, from my ear just walking outside, uh, even when we're operating on the loud side has been negligible. The building soaks up more sound than it honestly has in a business soaking up. Can't say why, but uh, if there's a concern with um, it being turned into a live music venue, I can say that I have operated at volumes as loud as I would want to operate without driving people out of the building. Uh, and the last noise complaint that I can remember is 2008 or 2009. We decided to open the windows on nice days. That proved to be a mistake. Um, but generally speaking, I would not expect uh, signature sounds to have a greater noise impact on Con Street than I have been having for a long period of time. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Jim? I'm Jim Olson. I'm from Whateley, Mass. But I've worked in Northampton for many, many years, and I'm one of the proposed buyers of the Deuce, along with uh, Peter Hamlin, my partner in this, who's from Northampton. And uh, a lot of uh, history has been given already about what we do, um, producing live music events for quite a while. I want to say we've kind of been through this once before when we initially moved to town in 2012 and opened the parlor room. Uh, at the time renting our building on Masonic Street. And there was a little bit of pushback from neighbors, you know, having a live music venue in such close proximity. And uh, over the years, we've uh, never had, as they mentioned, no police complaints, no noise complaints. Uh, you can ask any of our neighbors on Masonic Street. We are good neighbors. Um, we've outgrown that space uh, on Masonic Street. Um, it's a very limited space venue. So when we saw the listing for the World War II Club uh, and went and had a look, we thought it was ideal. And of course, we didn't anticipate any of these zoning issues that have popped up. Why would we? It's been going for 30 years with the same use as basically what we want to do with it. Um, I just want to say, you know, we, we love being in downtown Northampton and supporting downtown Northampton. Um, what it's come to for us is when we do need to uh, produce larger scale events with bands, we end up going somewhere else, whether it's Gateway City Arts in Holyoke or the Shea Theater in Turner's Falls. Um, we want to stay in downtown Northampton. We think the World War II Club is a perfect place to do it. We know we can operate it in a responsible manner and uh, be a good neighbor to the neighborhood and to continue to do the good work that the World War II Club does. Thank you. Else. Good afternoon, thank you. My name's Matthew Tebow. I am currently of Southampton, uh, though I did just sell my home on Wright Avenue. Um, and I am the treasurer for the World War II Club. Um, I'm speaking today to ask you, uh, and thank you to everybody that spoke so wonderfully about what we do over there and, and whatnot, but uh, to ask you, uh, for your support in this. 
There were a lot of great things said, so I don't need to ditto. Um, I want to speak specifically about um, the zoning and the issue from the planning board. Um, at the planning board meeting, it was raised, like Carolyn mentioned, that um, there was that, that we were trying to change these to central business without the architectural design standard to go with it. Um, more specifically, my understanding that there is not a separate and unique um, design standard specific to Cod Street. I find this to be, I find this as the sole reason not to approve this zoning change to be an unnecessary delay to what we're trying to do. Um, there are no current plans in this zone for any new construction, for any building permits or additions. There's no, uh, any of that going on at the moment. So any new architectural design standard would not um, impact any of the existing buildings that are currently looking to be rezoned. Um, moreover than that, the World War II Club specifically is an anomaly. So any specific, my understanding, I hope I'm getting this right, <laughs> Um, any specific architectural design standard for Conn Street or if the central business standard was just carried down from Conn Street would not apply to our property. Um, the anomaly um, follows a different set of zoning um, ordinance. So I'm asking today to, for, for all the reasons mentioned, to, uh, to vote in favor of this. Um, you know, a number of things were mentioned. I'll try to hit on things that weren't. Value was talked about. Um, I, you know what, that home I purchased on Wright Avenue, uh, I bought it before Netta was there. I sold it this summer, and um, it still appreciated with the market. There was no adverse effect of value from that perspective. Um, what else was talked about? Good neighbors, parking. Um, <laughs> we try to be such good neighbors that um, even uh, the neighbor who is here to speak in opposition advertises on our website that our customers can park in our lot and we've allowed that for 10 years. Um, this is, we've talked about empty storefronts so I don't want to go back there. We can talk about licensing. The only thing I'm really asking this board to do is approve the zoning change um, to allow for the transfer of our license. Um, the license that this board, or that the city gave us 38 years ago to operate in the way that we are operating. Um, I understand that Northampton has an overage right now from the ABC and from the um, State Licensing Commission with the inability to transfer this um, license um, through this sale. There is possibility that Northampton could lose that because it is an overage. So that's also an impacting factor. And I think that covered everything that wasn't said. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, opponents or people who were speaking in virtual sense? Yep. Uh, and as I said, yes, uh, please okay. identify yourself in the comments. Good evening. I'm Tetsu Gorfai from Northampton. And while I am adamantly opposed to this, I just want to say that signature sound sounds great. And what they're proposing to do, and the level in which they're proposing to do it, a larger scale level of bringing such great activities, the World War II Club does great things. Frankly speaking, I didn't even know until last week that the LGBTQ community relies on the World War II Club for a safe space. I'm a member of the LGBT community. I went in on Saturday night because I had a little argument with Louis um, Hasbrook. He said there was no dancing there, and I was going in to prove that there was, and I, do, I don't have to prove evidence that there's dancing all the time at the World War II Club. Is that correct? Do people know that? Or do I have to it's, it's show all It's not necessary all the, for a purpose of this. Uh, well, I, well, I have documentation with me that, that shows reviews of people. And people actually said that they danced here this evening. Um, I think that, that what the World War II Club offers and what Signature Sounds proposes is great. But I am scared to death of it happening on a larger scale. And should they be successful, and I want them to be, what it's going to do to a 
residential and mixed residential and commercial area neighborhood that's already uh, where noise and parking and um, behavior associated with uh, alcohol use is an issue for me and I believe for others as well. You'll hear from them perhaps. Um, but I would like to tell you a little bit about what it's like for me to live. Um, I measured today, my, the end of my house is 50 feet from the beginning of the World War II parking lot. So it's probably this, the length of this room. Um, so, um, and I, I want to say that um, it's not so bad in the winter time, um, but I definitely can hear music. And in the uh, warmer weather, when the windows are open, I can hear the music and I can feel that bass. Um, uh, silicone earplugs works really well, um, except for when the weather gets warmer. Then they don't work hardly at all. Um, so the parking lot is uh, 50 feet from my house. And in evenings, on Saturday evening, for example, there was some event. And the parking lot was so overfull, there were cars all the way down Smith Street and into Ralph's. I've got a picture of it on my cell phone. And sometimes there's so many cars there already that people park outside the lines of the world war, of, of the parking lot. And when that happens, I have a very difficult time getting in and out of my own driveway. So um, the main parking lot is on my side of the street, and I regularly hear as people go in, they turn their alarms on in the car, so I hear regular beeping. Um, people hang outside because they can't smoke inside. Um, and I smell the smoke, um, and as the evening goes on and there's more alcohol use, I hear loud talking, I have heard arguments, I've heard fighting, not physical fighting, but I've heard many, many times fighting. And when, the, when I said, uh, when the weather gets warm, again, I, you know, uh, 60 may be the new 40, but bedtime is still 9 o'clock. So um, uh, those silicone earplugs do not work. And um, maybe signature sounds will stop all activity at 11 o'clock. But the World War II closes at 2 p.m., 2 a.m. So I get woken up regularly. I have no option to put my bedroom on the other side of the apartment because the kitchen is there. So I am feet away um, from, from that. And um, so. I would just like, before I go on, because I've got a few things to say, before I go on, I would just like to ask everyone to just take a moment and ask yourself to be honest whether, and ask whether you would like to live 50 feet away from a highly active nightclub that plans to, as the word has been used several times, become, go on a larger scale than what the World War II club is already. They, people say it's not going to change. And maybe it won't, but, uh, you know, uh, it sounds like this is a very successful company. And once the zoning is changed, it's permanent. You can't put it back. Um, when I bought my place 11 and a half years ago, and I was naive enough to think that the World War II Club was a club. Um, I visited the, uh, my house during the day a couple times, and um, I had no reason to believe because the activity wasn't loud and there wasn't a lot of uh, uh, behavior associated with alcohol use, um, that it actually was a club. But it took me quite a while to figure out um, that there was a lot more going on. When I first bought the house, I went in front of the planning board, and um, I got a special permit um, of a psychotherapist, and I see 15 uh, clients a week from my office, which now I live in. And that planning board, they put me through the ringer around whether or not I was going to actually stick to those 15 clients a week, where they were going to park. And I did ask permission if people could use the World War II Club, and they said yes, they could. People can park in front of my house as well. But sometimes they can't do it when the World War II Club lot is full. So, um, so anyway, it took me a while to figure out what was going on, and I just thought this is the way it is. I have to, you know, put up with it. But it, again, it took me quite a while to figure that out. Um, and um, I also want to. I'm also concerned with the fact that when I went to the planning board, I was the only person who is an actual abutter. In other words, someone that is actually either on Pond Street, across the street, on Smith Street, that actually 
is right next to the World War II club. No, not, not one person that I've spoken to was notified of that meeting, and that seems to be, that's a great concern to me, given the impact that it can have. It, it will, the, the zoning change will have on our community. It was just by happenstance that I found out about this meeting. Um, this was three weeks ago. Um, and I just, want, I just want to say, on all four sides of the World War II Club, there are houses, there are uh, uh, pe people live in the houses, there are rental apartments all around the World War II Club. This is not, when people say, do you live in downtown Northampton? I say I live right outside of downtown Northampton, because in my mind, I don't live in downtown Northampton. This is a combined business and neighborhood area, which is how it's zoned. So I'm, oh, and I think that other than World War II Club, all, I, and I could be wrong, so I apologize if I'm wrong, um, but I think that all the other businesses can operate under uh, the, the present zoning if the, if the zoning doesn't go through. I want to suggest a radical idea. You know, something that isn't done in Washington for sure, but maybe we can do it in Northampton. Can we find a way to bring signature sounds in, have them find a uh, location that is not in the middle of a residential area? I know Diva's Nightclub has been out for years. Pearl Street, there's lots of, play, lots of empty space on King Street. Let's have a nightclub. Let's bring the revenue in for the city. Let's, you know, have, let's work with Signature Sound. I would, I would be part of the committee, I won't spearhead it, to help the LGBTQ community continue to have a space in Northampton where they can dance and they can have karaoke and they, they can have special events. I think that that's great, but please, not in a residential area. So... That's all that I have to say. I do have a letter from my next door neighbor, a butter, which is also directly across the street from the World War II Club on Con Street, who is out of town right now. If you, yeah, you could submit it, we'll put it in the public record. Okay, can I read it? Sure. Okay. So this is, um, this is from Mark Chen. He is the um, owner of Osaka Restaurant. He wanted me to make sure that I said he's very pro-restaurant in Northampton. But he is the owner of a, a house next to mine, and a lot of people who work at Osaka live in that house. And this is from him, and I will have to submit it. Uh, dear board members, I am the owner of a large apartment building at 62 Con Street, adjacent to the World War II Club. Several people live in this building, and I'm concerned about the proposed changes in zoning in our neighborhood. I've asked my neighbor to read this letter to you since I'm out of town this month and I am unable to attend. It is disturbing to me to learn that there's a proposed zoning change to the World War II Club. I also learned that currently and for the past few years, this club has not conducted business within the bounds of the zoning laws. There's already distinct noise level, especially in the evening, that goes along with this kind of business. Maintaining and protecting the residential atmosphere of this neighborhood is very important. I would not like to see any additional noise and activity in this area. I'm also concerned about more drunken behavior that would go along with alcohol use, and I'm also very concerned about the property values. I forgot to add that. I am terrified about the property values. And as a matter of fact, some, I, I cannot say, I won't say who it is, but some central person in, in Northampton said to me that if the zoning changes go through, my property value and those people on my street will be in demolishing our homes and putting it together for some kind of commercial use. And I'm terrified about that. So going on with what Mark says, that's just me. I'm therefore asking that the city of Northampton not make the changes to the current zoning and require that any business in our residential neighborhood conduct their business in accordance with the actual zoning of this neighborhood. Feel free to contact me with any questions and or to authenticate this letter. Thank you for your time and consideration. Mark Chen. Can we have a copy of that? So you can have it. Thank you, that's fine. You can come up, it's okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Shannon, the Henry Northampton. I'd like to ditto some of the points that um, Teddy made. My main concern is parking. I've had many times um, 
patrons at the World War II Club parking on my lawn, in my driveway, and if they have a bigger venue, where are they going to park? That's my main concern, is the parking. And there are incidences of drunken behavior, police reports and public record, that have happened that I have heard from my house. And that also concerns me. Is if that continues, you know, it's not, it's a residential neighborhood. It's where people live. Thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> oh, my name is uh, Dick Bart. I own the house right across the street at number 51. I've owned the house for about uh, at least 45 years, and I haven't had, I am. <laughs> A Vietnam veteran and I have been a member of the club many times and it seems that what they're doing um, is just on the borderline of not being disruptive as far as some of the evening entertainment. My tenants, I have a four family, I live in Haydenville, but I'm certainly concerned about my tenants, my ability to rent it, my property values, and I think if this goes and becomes a nightclub, these, obviously these gentlemen seem to have really good references, good resumes. They could also sell it in a year or two. They probably won't, but we've got to consider all the alternatives. And uh, I think this will definitely decrease my property values and uh, might make it harder for me to obtain tenants. And so I, I'm quite concerned. And I have had occasions where people did park on my property when World War II was full. And this venue is going to be significantly larger from everything I read and understand. So I have some concerns. And as I say, it's not about these new owners, because I have asked different people, and uh, they're a reputable gentlemen. But I have an investment there, and I want to protect it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kind of clarification? Sure. My name is Farnsworth Loganstein. I live in Northampton. There is a solution to this. <laughs> it requires a key. Um, as someone who appreciates signature sounds and attends their concerts, there is a fundamental misunderstanding in the phrasing that they want an even bigger club than the World War II club. Signature sounds now seats 80. They want to be able to get more people. Signature Sounds largely provides acoustic music, some of it non-acoustic, but it is that kind of music that they're presenting, it's folk music. In fact, the sale of this property to Signature Sounds, I believe, will greatly decrease the noise, will greatly decrease the drunken behavior um, for all of their events. They want to be open to continuing events for the veterans, which has been more problematic. But they're bringing a very different style and type of music to the event. And they want to go from 80 to whatever, 120 people, not that they want to create even bigger than um, the Duke does now. Thank you. Um, I should point out that while we are hearing testimony about a specific project on a specific lot, we're actually not voting on a project. We're not voting on that lot. That lot will be included in the discussion, but just so we're clear, you may be disappointed by our deliberation and our discussion, but the, the, the fact remains is that we're creating a law for the properties uh, specified and not for an individual project. Anyone else want to speak in opposition? Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Sharon Kruzan, I own a house on Con Street. It's been in my family for 74 years. My children will inherit it. I am not within the new zoning. 
area. I'm on the north end. However, Northampton has a history of creeping. So if this zone happens, it will creep up the street, which then affects my children's welfare in the future and what they can do with the property. So if they decide they want to rent it, whatever they decide to do, if it is a commercial, correct me if I'm wrong, this is what I've been told, if it's a CD, there is no residential living on the first floor, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Even if they inherit it, I don't, I'm not going to own it anymore, they're going to inherit it. Is that a grandfathered? This would be, you're actually touching on the pre-existing non-conforming use discussion that we're having. That is my biggest concern. Again, Northampton has a history of creeping. I have no problem with the world. Through. I hung out there before some of these people were even born. And I'm only 29. So, <laughs> um, I love the World War II book. The dancing pool, whatever. I just have a problem with my piece of property eventually getting swallowed up by that broke, that bubble. And I know that it's going to happen. I was here a few years ago for just about the same thing when we talked about rezoning all of Con Street. And again, my, my children's future, their children's future, this house isn't going anywhere in their family. Um, so I really want to preserve it for them. Um, the other thing I have to ask is, if that is a restriction for a CD property, and you have an individual within your family who has a disability and cannot live on the second floor, and again, I haven't done any research, so I need, is there a provision um, for that? Uh, ask the solicitor, does uh, ADA Trump, pardon the use of the term, no. Okay. A new building, which if it's one of a certain type, would require an elevator, but a disability. Uh, is not Trump. This is zoning. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, let, let, let's let folks who haven't spoken yet, and then I'll get back to you. Yes, sir. I'll be quick. Uh, my name is Frank Patel, and I own the 59 Con Street, which is right across the World War Club. And again, uh, the only, like, my main concern is the parking. Like, so many issues. Like, a couple of times in the past few years, I've seen cars that do not belong to my tenants, and I got a lot of complaints over that. And then also, I've seen, like, I do my landscape myself, and I've seen a lot of, like, beers and liquor bottles on my landscaping and cigarettes and stuff like that. So uh, again, it's a residential and I want to keep it as it is, you know, like I request to not make it in a large scale uh, uh, World War II, but they were just only they're, they're requesting I to keep it as a residential. That's my concern. I want to protect my investment. Anyone else? I was waiting, Council Murphy. For well, I wanted to let the yeah, that's right. okay. oh. and I promise. Oh. Okay. I'll keep, I'm going to stick to the zoning. <laughs> I know you. Will. You know it. And it's good it's earlier in the year because you guys haven't exhausted your overtime budget yet, so you'll be able to cover this now. the length of, of this hearing. So I'm the one that, that, that at the planning board brought up the question, you know, because it's two distinct uh, entities: central business zoning and the central business architecture overlay for design control. And when this was brought forward, it was brought forward without the design control. Um, in fact, I know the planners have talked about changing the zoning and going to a, a form code based zoning that would allow for different design controls in different parts of downtown because knowing central business architecture really well, that's what I've ever been thrown off of. Um, no, you weren't there when that happened. I don't think anybody's here when that happened. Um, the, it was designed to protect downtown, the Central Business District, Main Street. So most, most of its focus is on making Main Street stay looking like Main Street. So the further you get from Main Street, the less applicable it becomes. So I think a lot of why it didn't get included initially was it doesn't really fit down there. Uh, and I brought that up at the planning board that um, I don't so much, it, 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 
object to the zone change because I can keep doing what I'm doing and I've been there 27 years. I'm an immediate butter to the left of the World War II club. Um, I'm just concerned with what I'm going to end up with for uh, design controls for the architectural district. And was asking, gee, can you, you know, give me some kind of idea, since you're talking about changing without design controls, what I'm going to get. Because that I, I am concerned with, because essentially any building permit I would take for exterior use would have one more step going before the architectural committee to get my permit approved. Um, their solution to that, uh, sort of very off the cuff, was then to decide to bring the architectural controls that don't actually fit down there, down there. Which seemed to me not to be a very good fix. Um, at all, because they really don't fit that way. So I don't object so much to the zoning, because frankly, I can keep doing what I'm doing. If the venue gets more active, I'm certainly going to, you know, find more more bottles in the parking lot and a little more noise at night, perhaps, if the venue gets busier. I can still do what I'm doing. It's design controls that aren't appropriate. They're going to be more of a pain in the neck. So I would encourage you to leave to leave those off. Uh, that last hearing, they came up sort of as an, oh, by the way, well, I guess we could keep using the ones we've got, and that seemed to prevail. Um, but I think the initial response from the planners not including it was probably more practical because they're going to go at some point and deal with the growth of central business, and they're going to deal with having perhaps design controls that are more suitable to the areas it's growing in. You know, they want to bring it further down Pleasant Street. Uh, Carolyn said they ultimately want to do the rest of Con Street. Um, most of everything that is not either already central business or that they're proposing this time to make central business is residential. And they're the ones that are going to have a hard time because they're the ones that are going to lose them eventually. You know, their, their first floor uses will be grandfathered, but there's some sites that are buildable that are residential. One across the street from me, one further down the street. They're not going to be able to put a two-family house on that site and have residential on the first floor if they change it to central business. That isn't going to be permitted. So it's going to affect them more than me. It's just the design controls that I don't think are appropriate because they just don't fit the further you get away from the central core of Main Street in downtown Northampton. Those are the buildings that it was designed to protect. I'd encourage you, if you're going to go ahead and do this, that you, you leave the design controls off of it and wait until they get developed. And, and in fact, if it wasn't for the fact that this World War II issue has come up with selling it, because it was, you know, it was determined that, hey, it hasn't been conforming, so no, you can't sell it to somebody else with this kind of license, because it, it theoretically was a club, but it has a regular license. Um, so it can be more than just a club. If that urgency wasn't like right now, because there's a deal taking place, we wouldn't be talking about this right now. We'd be taking the time to perhaps do the code-based zoning, modify the design district to follow it in a timely manner, if you recall, last time I was here, we're talking about cell phone, cell phone towers, and we took a little more time to get that one right. Uh, in this instance, I really don't want to see central business architectural controls coming down Con Street this way. Better, better controls can be come up with. It's just a matter of timing. This has to get rushed, but leave that off. I, I would I'd appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Very quick, I promise. Um, so <coughs> I have in front of me the um, uh, zoning uh, special permit application for the World War II Club that was done in 2010. And it reads, um, we have seating for, at our bar for 65 people. So in terms of the math that I'm doing, in terms of what Signature Sound is proposing, it is, there's no question that it's going to be a larger venue. And um, as other people have said, I just want to say, if you do the math and do the thinking, it can't help but be louder, noisier, and your parking is going to become more and more of an issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I actually could, I think, can address what you were, you're about to say. The, that's for the bar. It's not for the, it's not for the venue, the, uh, the entertainment space. So that application was only for the capacity of people being served in that room, in the front room that you go to. Is that what you were going to? Okay. Anyone else? Ask for a motion to close the public hearing. Motion to close the public hearing. Second. All, 
All those in favor of closing the public hearing, please say aye. Aye. Okay, so I'm going to do to you folks the same thing I did to the folks, because <laughs> Attorney Etheridge is here, and he's, he's been here a very long time. I wanted to talk about Wright Avenue when I did skip over that. So the next hearing. Up is uh, item 19.17. Change of condition to rezone right now. You are C for residential uh, to general business. Um, I'll accept the motion. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, Council. Just a point of clarification. Um, upon deliberation at the end of the evening, the public hearing is still closed. It's just listening to it's still closed. Right? This is the process by which all these things will proceed. We will make a recommendation, either positive, neutral, or negative, that will go to the council. Then there's a whole new opportunity for the public to uh, participate in that conversation in public. Two, not one, but two city council meetings. So lots of opportunity. You're watching the slight pace of. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate so, that point of uh, clarification. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry. Uh, so I'll accept a motion to open the hearing. <laughs> Second one, you get a chance. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 I'm talking to you. I'm saying again. If the public hearing is convened, Councilor Rutherford, would you please identify yourself and where you uh, were you? Edward Etheridge of North Thank you. I was second on the agenda, now third. Yes, that's all. Um, <laughs> my apologies. I, I uh, you notice how the rules This is an application for a zone change under uh, 350 section 3.4. To change <coughs> one lot on Wright Avenue, number three Wright Avenue, from the URC zoning district to the GV zoning district. Uh, the lot is surrounded on three sides by the uh, uh, general business zoning district. Uh, it abuts the rear of Netta, uh, who is purchasing the lot. Uh, Gretna Green, who is the landlord for Netta, is purchasing the lot to add additional parking there. The uh, planning board has already spoken in favor of the zone change. Um, it uh, matches the existing zoning, as I said, on three sides. The uh, landlord, the owner, has uh, already obtained a special permit uh, for the site to put in the parking for Netta, which they wanted to do but there was some issue about whether or not uh, uh, the permit would be appealed or whatever. Plus, they want to make it as a long-term solution. So they've applied for the zone change for that particular lot on right now. you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Sir, did you say it, it's going to central business, right, not general business? This is the general business, not central business. Okay. All the rest of these are, yeah, like Times Street are for this was separate. Yes. Right. This I is general business. I can clarify. Yeah, Carolyn will, will fill it in. Does anybody, do, do you have any questions, sir, for Attorney Etheridge? The, no. Uh, I saw Leslie Laurie here at one point. Yeah. Did she go home? Was she going to. Uh, Leslie came. She was, yeah, she was late. I guess she had to go to a meeting. But she, um, the, the parking pressures, as you, as you managed to survive, two other hearings discussing parking pressures. This is, this is Netta's response to that. Their opportunity, they see an opportunity with, by expanding their parking lot and reducing some of the pressures on of, uh, the surrounding streets. That's correct. correct. Yes. Yes, it will merge under zoning with Netta's. Uh, right, and it's a seamless connection on the two properties. Yes, correct. Uh, Carolyn, did you want to frame this at all? That's it. Yeah, sure. So, um, as you can see, um, the lot in question is currently Urban Residential C, and all of that part of Wright Avenue is um, Urban Residential C, but the lots on Fulton and South are general business, and the net of parcels are on general business. Um, the reason we didn't at this time suggest that it go to um, central business is again um, because we are working on a form based code for downtown and looking at expanding central business potentially to the roundabout but treat gateway corridors in a very different way than we treat the main street within central business by having sub districts and different design characteristics for that. But given that this was already abutting a general business district, it um, didn't seem to make sense to go to central business, even though the other parcels on Pond Street are being proposed to go to central business, just because 
it was going to be it's merged into a parcel that's already in general business. So until such time as it makes sense for, you know, the first step is we're going to be finalizing with a consultant the form-based code for um, central business and then um, coming up with proposals of where those, um, that district should be expanded. And eventually the goal is really to sort of um, merge all of these <coughs> into one district, but with um, sub-districts within that would be treated differently. Um, I'm going to avail myself of the opportunity of having two of the best land use attorneys in the in the state here in the room. I'm concerned about one specific property being rezoned for one specific proposal that's a, a discussion of a contract as just the possibility of us that could that be qualified as spot zone? I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> constitute spot zone because it's not incongruent with the zones that are around it. Um, it is not something that's done um, without any planning, without any input from planning. Uh, and uh, the SJC has been very reluctant to find spot zoning as the time has gone on. Um, it's only when you are going to put an island of commercial in the middle of a sea of single family residents that eyebrows will go, this is not going to be uh, this wouldn't tickle. This wouldn't tickle. No. So, do you agree with that? One hundred percent. It's as I mentioned. It's on three sides. It's already GB. Right. Yep. Just filling in a hole. I need to cross T's and dot I's. So thank you for that information. I appreciate it. Uh, any other questions, yeah. Councilor Thorpe? Thank you. Uh, so looking here at the petition for amendment of the zoning map, maybe this was answered already well this uh, out of the room. But it says here that 10 registered voters in the city of Northampton petitioned the city council to change the zoning district. I see uh, names and signatures here. Are they from the, uh, that area, the right avenue? Um, it's voters, not required to be from the area being proposed. That's Thank not you. a requirement. Question, any other questions? Uh, I'll accept the motion to close the public hearing. Mm -hmm. okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Ed, I'm afraid you're going to have to wait like everybody else. I'll find out tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Now, let's see. Yeah, you're on Old South Street, aren't we? Now we're moving down to Old South Street, Clark Avenue. This is item 20.005, an ordinance to amend the zoning map on Old South Street and Clark Avenue. Uh, accept a motion to open public hearing. Yes, open public hearing. Sure. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay, so we are joined. Uh, Carolyn. Okay. Right. So, um, this is an area, a uh, portion of, of, our, of three parcels that are already currently split zoned, um, just right over here on the other side of the roundhouse parking lot. So the area in yellow represents um, the area of the rear of three properties on that face Clark Street. So they're residential, multifamily residential structures that, that front on Old South and Clark. Um, the very rear of the properties is currently um, central business. The um, propose, proposal is just to pull that line back down to essentially the rear of those three existing residential structures um, and make that central business. It provides a viable um, opportunity for development that would front and have access from the roundhouse parking lot um, in as configured with the additional land that would be rezoned to central business district um, in this case we again did not propose to bring along the central business design standards because again um, planning for um, the form-based code that would be coming along the way that would include many of those design um, requirements would not um, would be coming in we think maybe within six months um, so we thought we would just hold off on that 
interestingly, the planning board did not have a concern about making the central business map change to this area as they had on Con Street. And the reason for that is that the front, the front portions of these parcels already are central business. So the areas that would be developed that you'd see from the parking lot would already be subject to those design guidelines. So it did not, um, um, it, would, it did not create the same concern about um, not having a design um, standard characteristic for this area as it would on Con Street, where there's nothing now on Con Street. And um, additionally, we do allow residential on the first floor for um, in the central business district as long as the building doesn't front on a public street, um, or the rear of the building could be used for residential as well, even if. Yeah, so in terms of creating any non-conforming situations, uh, residential use is allowed sort of in the back portion right now of buildings in central business. Um, however, we are also looking at modifications for those gateway corridors um, to allow residential anywhere in those structures because that um, portion of the city is different than the main street um, downtown. But so the planning board, um, deliberated about whether or not to require this going, you know, make a recommendation about this, and they were not concerned at this time about the things. Um, wow. So uh, anyone else here to speak about this issue? Or? Okay, counselors, do you have any questions? Thank you. So I see here the change would keep the homes on Old South Street and Clark Avenue within the urban residential C zoning district. Right. And expand the CV slightly in the rear yards of those homes. Right. And when you talk about urban residential C, that is the most dense, correct? Of the residential, the residential. districts. Yep. Thank you. Yep. So essentially, you the desire to do this is just to, as part of a, 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 a continuing discussion about form code and to have these set in place at the time the form <coughs> code when, it, when it's developed can be applied. Yeah, so actually uh, that's part of it. The other part is we're looking for places that make sense to allow um, more commercial development to support downtown. If it could be commercial in the sense of high density residential, or it could be commercial in the sense of office or um, um, back office uses. Um, and there was actually a proposal, a, a concept for a project on the back side to develop sort of the, the back portion of the lots a few years ago, and that would have triggered a requirement for the zoning change. That project never came to fruition, but it it really started um, us thinking more um, rigorously about the opportunities of, of um, untapped potential, basically right at the parking lot there and right in downtown. Um, so that's why we're bringing this forward now. Any other questions? I might have missed this. Oh, the, and, but that is not, was, why was that never considered a, 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 a zoned as central business? And, Where Netta is? Yeah, um, because that, you're saying that's general business. Right, so that well, that's and, the, actually, that's yeah, this the, is a different year. That's the last year we lost you. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay, that's all right. That's all right. It's, it's okay. Actually, the, the, yeah. the thrust of the question holds, and the and the same and the same kind of pressures exist in, in some respect. I mean, one was to accommodate yeah. uh, parking stressors proximate to Netta. This one actually is a potential undeveloped property that is limited. Old South and Clark. Right. That's currently limited by its by the zoning, and it's kind of wonky zoning as you can look. Yeah. Um, and. Wrong. And I think the idea is with the fronting on South Street, <coughs> uh, what's sometimes called New South Street, uh, would allow, if we if that is converted, I think the proposal if that is converted to, um, to central business, that uh, project develop in there that would have uh, retail on the ground floor, 
residential above me. And that's central business? That's, in, that's a central okay, business. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Pulse. <laughs> Councilor Jerry. <laughs> Um, so would the access to this be through the roundhouse parking lot? Is that yes. what's envisioned? Yes. So we've actually, so there are three property owners that are part of this there. As part of the redesign and uh, redevelopment of the roundhouse parking lot, um, we've worked with those property owners um, to consolidate access to one point from the parking lot so there would be a shared access to for all three parcels in the event that they don't work together to do a master plan development um, uh, there's a um, location that's been surveyed for one single access point so that it doesn't the, the whole point of redesigning the parking lot was to um, make it more efficient create some more parking spaces public parking spaces and so through that process, we figured out a way where um, there could be access, but we could still be adding parking to that lot. Would the frontage then be considered on the parking lot as opposed to South Street? Yeah, um, well, it could be. We don't actually require frontage in the Central Business District for any parcel. So um, a, pro a property does not have to front on a public way in, in Central Business or um, Planned Village for that matter. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. Any other questions? I'll accept a motion to close the public hearing. Move to close public hearing. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of closing the public hearing, please say hi. Uh, please aye. say hi. Please say hi. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> please say hi. Oh. Um, the last hearing we have scheduled that was scheduled for 6 o'clock, and we're only an hour off of it. It's not bad. Uh, this is item 20.006. This is an ordinance to amend the zoning map and add a new smart growth overlay district at Laurel Street. I'll accept a motion to open the public hearing. Move to open the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay. Public hearing is joined. Uh, Carolyn, while you're up. Yeah. Um, so this. Um, this, there's a parcel um, up at the former state hospitals in the lower left corner of the screen. To zoom down just a little bit so it gets in the screen. Um, and it's currently zoned in the planned village district. Um, and it was a parcel that was deeded out from the state to the Northampton Housing Authority for the purposes of creating affordable housing. The state took it back because the housing authority didn't build on it <laughs> in time. So we're in the process of um, getting legislation passed for the state to give it back to the city for the purposes of creating affordable housing once again. Uh, however, um, and, and I'll say this parcel was never part of the overall master plan that Mass Development came forward to the planning board for the redevelopment of the state hospital properties. So um, because it was always assumed that it was going to be North Has uh, Hampton Housing Authority was going to build however many units they could under the planned village zone, there's not, a minute, there's not a maximum number of units, but it would require a planning board review. Um, so. Uh, since that time that the master plan was approved, the state, um, we've gone through several iterations of um, housing incentives that have been um, created at the state level for communities to build affordable housing under what's called Smart Growth Districts, or 40R. And um, I think 2007, the city adopted its first uh, smart growth overlay districts at the state hospital so, and there are, there are sub districts yeah. I don't even know what that is sounds like an amber alert oh, yeah. signal but it's not sorry oh just oh, the yeah. market's collapsed don't worry about it <laughs> <laughs> everyone has a virus um so 
um, the city went forward through this process at the state level to create a um, sub-district, um, sub, um, sorry, smart growth districts at the state hospital. What that allowed is for the, um, um, it's, it creates what's supposed to be a smoother path for approval. Um, and part of the, um, part of the package is you're going to build affordable housing. And if you do build affordable housing under those adopted smart growth districts, then the state will give the city or the community um, money for each unit that's been um, created under that smart growth district. So um, uh, we did that at the state hospital. More recently, we expanded the smart growth overlay district maybe two years ago up at the state hospital by creating a sub-district C. And then at the same time, we created another smart growth overlay on Bridge Street for just one parcel where the Valley CDC is doing its um, SRO project. And again, it was knowing that we were going to be building affordable housing units within those districts and wanting to take advantage of the state incentive to receive money back from the state on a per unit basis um, for the units that are created within the district. So. Um, what we're proposing now is to have a 40R overlay sub-district C expanded down from the northern portion of the state hospital to also include this one, eight, one parcel that's 1.5 acres thereabout for housing. And we know it's going to be affordable housing, so we know we'd be eligible from this, um, to receive funds from the state for each unit that's built. So it's really not changing the density allowances in the, that would be allowed on this property. You'd either have to go through special permit um, as an applicant to the planning board under the smart, under the plan village district, or go through a 40R if the 40R overlay is adopted for this site. Um, so that's what this um, provision, the proposal is, is all about, just to make sure that we get to capture those resources. And I will say, we use those resources as um, launching projects um, to address traffic. Um, um, in downtown, we are, that money actually that we received already in payments from the state hospital development, or some of the units at the state hospital has gone into the um, design money for Main Street, redesigning Main Street to address pedestrian and um, traffic safety. So we've already been um, had the benefit of these resources from the state to um, to balance the new units that are up there. Questions? <clears throat> Well, I'm always excited to hear about um, affordable housing being in the works, so it's exciting. It, it was, for 30 years, it was part of the vision of uh, what's now called Village Hill. Um, at the time, it was called Hospital Hill. And, in fact, the pressures, the, the uh, number of communities in the state who had uh, decommissioned hospitals, state hospitals, many places like Devon converted them to golf courses and things like that, municipal golf courses, and, um, basically signs of affluence. Northampton was really adamant about um, having mixed affordability, creating a concentrated neighborhood that conformed with um, smart growth, a, a smart growth philosophy, put approximate to downtown, allow for uh, houses to be built up close to the street create more of a neighborhood feel for it. And by and large, with some huge gaps, <laughs> that project was realized, as I said, over 30 years, and it took some time and some fights, to be sure. The affordable dimension was never the proportion that I particularly aspired to and that was originally aspired to. And anything that we can do proximate to this or comprehensively part of it to contribute to the affordable housing really makes, uh, makes a lot of sense. And it's, um, do, do I understand that the, it was the housing authority that was originally considering this, so that would have been a federal project as well, that would have had federal funds? Um, probably, I mean, it was deeded to the housing authority um, specifically for so that. Been a HUD project. I think that was in the early 80s. Right, right, yeah. right. And so now, if by 
trying to get it back from the state, our goal, it would come to the city, but we would immediately put out an RFP for an affordable housing developer to come and take on the project. So the city's not going to be building the affordable housing, no. or nor is the housing authority. But the, the stipulation would be it would have to be for the purposes of creating affordable housing units. Legislation, so yeah. we don't have a choice. Right. And you right. won't run into the same problem as before where the housing isn't built. We're hoping, I mean, that's why we want to do this. And, and the other piece is we wanted to get the zoning in place because we have a certain amount of time to spend block grant money to help um, get this off the ground. And we're running up against the clock for um, spending those dollars. So we spent some money already to get a survey to send it to the state legislature. So, we're, so um, uh, there is one piece that I want to let you know about that I've been trying to connect with the state. The state actually has approved the 40R language and any modifications to it before it can be um, accepted as, even if the city were to vote on it. Um, I've been trying to get in touch with um, the person at the state who does, um, does these approvals. I initially, um, we passed information, I gave them the spreadsheet that they require showing, you know, how many units could possibly be developed under this, and um, I haven't heard anything back. So, um, I'm, my goal is to try to make sure we're still on track with the state by the time you get to your vote at, um, on council floor, but that is one, I don't know if you recall, some of your council, some of you were on council when we did the last ex extension, and we had to wait a couple of hearings before, or um, votes, so that the state finally approved the language. We're hoping this is much simpler, because it's just a physical boundary change, not any text change. Mark, did you have I, I just was, I had a question, like sure. Rachel, I think, had it answered, though. Uh, my first question was, is it going to go to a private developer possibly, which it sounds like it could do that for to build this low income or affordable housing, which is great. Um, and the other thing is the time limit thing that Rachel uh, asked about. So that could potentially, there could be a time limit on this. If you don't find somebody to, to develop it, could it go away again? <laughs> Well, no, it wouldn't go away. The time limit now is maybe uh, means that we can't use that block grant money for the project. So we we pulled some block grant funds to help um, do some um, construction costs um, to allocate for this parcel. So surveying, I think, is the main thing, and we have to pay that money back to the block grant fund if we don't start using it for the actual construction of affordable units. Um, and it would be most likely because these are going to be subsidized affordable housing, it's not going to be a private. Developers going to be more like a nonprofit, like a Valley CDC Valley or CDC. Habitat. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? I'll accept a motion to close the public hearing. Move to close the public hearing. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Let's get this out of the way first. Uh, minutes for February 10th, 2020. We'll accept a motion for approval of the minutes. Approval of the minutes. Second. Okay. All those in favor of approving the minutes of February 10th, 2020, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. You want a little break? Yes. Okay. We're going to go into recess. We'll recess for five minutes and then we'll reconvene and ask for deliberations. I probably should do that so I don't miss anything. Okay. Yeah, I have a little dry. I know, I know, I know. Are you all right, though? Yeah. You able to stick it out? Do you need cough drops? No, she's got um, My she's spouse packages. came and dropped them off because I wanted to stay. So I have some. I keep them in the car. Don't want to be disruptive. Well, we might all have to FaceTime in a couple weeks anyway. That's, well, that's, you know what? We don't have regulations for that. No? I was thinking about that. If they actually, you can have one person participate remotely, you can't have an entire body. Oh, no. And 
we at least we don't have the rules for it, and the state has an off license. So in which case, if that were to come to pass, the government would stop. It would stop. So if, if, you, if you, there, you can't hold public meetings, you can't move forward with uh, decisions. See, Irish canceled all of its campaigns. Yeah, yeah. That's a sign of the apocalypse. Okay. Well, Italy is completely the entire country now. They didn't even follow to the north. Now all of it really is now limited, limited quarantine for the whole nation. So my Italian trip doesn't seem really likely. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> You're back doesn't seem very good. No, not just yeah. like stay there. Just so you can't even get there. No, you can't even get there. Get there. Just I'd have to sneak in through uh, <laughs> Greece or something across the Aegean. I don't know. So, yeah, strange times. So. Yes. It was very strange that you know, all the time you know, you know the elderly, the infirm should you know, avoid things. I'm literally the highest profile candidate for time. Oh, no. So, I mean, yeah. Uh, immune suppressed, diabetic, 65 or older. Oh, I don't <laughs> know. Oh, yes. I feel like, I feel like dues are coming. My dues are coming too. You're washing your hands. I, you know, at some point, obsession turns to what the hell. <laughs> Well, if I was at the end of my, I asked my doctor, I don't think I'm in the yeah, so zone of right. but, but the thing is, you don't want to be compromised when it does arrive. Like, you don't want to already have a call. Right. 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 What kind of, what kind of, of digital, kind of digital of take sciences of a brain? Can you do experiments? Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. I met a very nice lady who slept in the bleach aisle. Well, the last time we had a mega amount of toilet paper, so I couldn't find anything I was looking for because they. Well, if there's anything scheduled here for this. Do you wish to restore? Well, they would have showed up. So it's a stop and job. A lot of bleach, a lot of toilet paper. That was five o'clock. We just did five hearings, by God. I've, I've never done five hearings in legislative matters ever, ever. Mm -hmm. I've never been in legislative matters for more than like an hour, an hour and a half, right? Yeah. It's pretty quick. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. saying a special thank you to Carol. Yeah. <laughs> Stick with me. You'll have more and more. <laughs> I hope not. That literally would cancel everything. The floor goes away, that's it. Oh, yeah. No. I'm pulling up stakes. We'll just look like lab idiots. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't. I think that ship has sailed. <laughs> I think it's more like lab. Yeah, that's right. Right. <laughs> no, what is it? Well, Carolyn got a big bit of green. Right. Yeah, but since we've been here, it's been over 28 cases. Really? Oh, it's 28 cases of that. Really? No, 41. 41 cases. There's 28 earlier. That's what five years ago. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Yes, we did. I was in charge. I was in charge. I was in charge. It's true. It's true. Okay, we're coming out of recess. And we're back. For those of you following along at home, we're just going to scroll right back up to the top of the agenda. Uh, right for the first item, which is item 19.173. This is an ordinance to allow change from one conforming use to another without a final. I'll accept a motion. Maybe just a motion, just for purposes of discussion. Um, we'll do a positive recommendation. Is there a second? 
It doesn't commit you to the positive recommendation, it just puts it on the floor for purposes of discussion. Thank you. Second. This is uh, the first voting time. That's okay. Legislative matters, so I'd, I'd like to learn. It's perfectly fine. You did the right thing. Okay. So we are convened and we are now allowed to discuss this. Uh, anyone want to start the conversation? Council Show is looking for her file. Oops, right. I find yeah. the right pile of papers. Does anyone have any? I have a quick question. Yeah, yeah. sure. Go, go for it. Um, Carolyn, could you kind of quickly go through the different or sort of the pertinent classes of residential for us here? So, so we have the name and then there's the class. So, both central business and uh, neighborhood business are under business B district as a class? Um, yes. Can you tell me what's the difference between like business B district and say like, well, all the business ones are B district. So what designates sort of a business district, B district versus sort of residential, even though there is residential within this? Um, so um, a business district um, allows non-residential uses and depending on what kind of business district it is, it allows, um, more intense or less intense commercial uses that are non-residential. Does that answer your question? So Central Business District is the, I would say, is the most intense, meaning the widest range of uses, the tallest structures, um, the um, least amount of setback um, or frontage, actually no frontage is required, and, um, no setbacks are required. So from that perspective, it's the most intense um, resi or, sorry, commercial district. Um, residential districts, on the other hand, um, urban residential C does allow some very small number of mixed use uh, or non-residential uses with a special permit from the planning board, but they're really typically sort of back office uses um, yeah. and it has to be part of a residential component you can't just have a commercial use in a residential district in urc it, there has to be some residential um, space so there's some um, properties on state street that went through a special permit where there's a residential building but then on the same property there's a building that has an office um, so those that's what we would consider a mixed um, residential and that's only allowed in the urban residential C. In B and A and all the other residential districts no amount of commercial is, is allowed except as part of a home business so that's where you live in your home and you conduct some of your work out of your home. Thank you. So relative to this issue of addressing non-conforming uses and making the modifications and the concern over uh, zoning board sign off among others. Um, are there any thoughts or comments about this and discussion for debate? Well, let's start, how about this? So let me facilitate this. What were the the counselors are receiving here. We're going to have to vote on this. What are what are your objections or concerns? And then we can go to what you think why this would make sense. So, what would your concerns be? So, if I can start, uh, yes, Councilor Dwight, uh, I do know that there does need to be a, uh, a change with zoning, not just you know uh, here in the <coughs> but across the state. Um, so, I had uh, listened to. Um, and heard from those proponents and uh, those opponents regarding this change, and um, I'm in favor of the change, but I'm also considering whether it would be uh, beneficial to also look at uh, keeping a required finding, which was proposed, uh, with detailed review criteria for the Zoning Board of Appeals for parcels that do not otherwise trigger a planning board appeal, um, which I think is um, not appropriate, but would be appropriate to kind of like uh, happy media. So, well, when, 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 it, when it should come to that, then you might be able to offer that as well. Right, that's just what I, that's my thought for sure. Yes, um, I just want to clarify this. So, the zoning, it hasn't changed since the last, um, the, the amendment's the same 
uh, nothing was added. I'm just looking through it. No, there were no <coughs> new revisions. Okay, just want to make sure. We're there talking. was a memo from the planning office offering possible accommodations for some expressed concerns. Okay. Well, I will say that I really struggled with this, um, I, which is what, it, what I think I should be doing. I should be struggling with it because I'm hearing. Um, you know, I'm hearing some concerns. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad, actually, that we voted to extend it, the public hearing time I'm, um, because I think the, the, the concern I hear from residents about feeling fast tracked, whether, you know, that, how true that is and, and what the process really looks like, I think it, it, there's, there is, isn't, um, to me, there's only gain from, from looking at this thoughtfully since it is, these are permanent changes to our community and they impact people's lives. Um, you know, what I see is a, a zoning ordinance that is inconsistent, um, and, and I think it needs to be amended. Um, but I also cannot deny that there's kind of repercussions um, to doing so. And so that's where the struggle for me is. It's obvious, Carolyn, the planning board, and the residents as well, uh, they've all put a lot of, of thought and work um, into this. And I agree with Carolyn uh, that using um, inconsistency um, in a zoning ordinance um, as kind of a check um, a check and balance. It doesn't really provide the transparency and the clarity that I would like to see in, in a check and balance around development. And I really think that's the, um, should be the task of the planning board and, and the zoning board of appeals that kind of have the skill set and the, the experience. So I, I, I would prefer to see those checks and balances happen within the planning board and I kind of would encourage them to you know to flex their muscle and um, and and do the critical thinking there because they are so knowledgeable and really um, address residents concerns um, so so that's kind of where I'm at I um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else that's kind of a concern versus a so there's this kind of yeah there's this kind of looking at the at the ordinance and knowing it needs to be amended, seeing it kind of as a glitch, um, but also I don't want to deny that there there's possible repercussions. Um, um, can I ask Carolyn? May I ask Carolyn? Yeah, yeah. So we heard a lot of or we heard some value judgments on lots, like that lots are bad or terrible. Um, we also heard that on about members of uh, different boards. Um, would you, it, it seems like an odd thing to say about a, a particularly an old New England town. We have these non-conforming lots because of how um, Northampton grew and uh, at a time when there wasn't conform, nothing to conform to. Um, could you talk a little bit about your thoughts on, you know, that sort of characterization of a lot or how to characterize yeah. you know, a lot of Northampton, not just, do we all live in like bad, terrible lots? <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't, I don't, I won't make a value judgment about that per se, but I will, uh, you know, I think the issue is more about how lots can function, whatever their characteristic is. So, um, the lots that don't conform to today's standards are because today we have very uniform rectangles that um, are um, def are part of the zoning. So that when we start building new, then then there's a little bit more uniformity and organization to those lots. Um, that wasn't always the case, obviously, because we have some lots, a, a lot of lots that um, aren't don't meet this, those same standards that we would want to see in new parcels. But yet there's still functionality to them, and so the um, state statutes allow this provision to um, say, okay, you can set the rules for new new lots, and yes, that means that there will be other lots that don't meet those new rules, but you can, here's a path for you to evaluate um, um, those characteristics in light of changes that happen to them. So I don't, um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I guess they, I think that um, it doesn't, since they are functioning now with people um, at, 
going um, to and from and, and using those a lot, I wouldn't necessarily um, classify them as bad. Again, I'll go back to the fact that in some districts we have very different requirements for lots than in other districts. So, um, um, in that case, you know, if you're going to call a lot that doesn't conform in one district to certain standards um, bad, you might have that very same lot in a different district that complies completely. So, that's another reason sort of not to think about them in terms of that value of good or bad. When, um, when the current Zoning Act was passed in the, in the 70s, uh, there was a lot of debate about what to do about non-conforming lots. Mm -hmm. And the decision was to protect them. So that if you have a lot uh, that is in existence um, at the time the zone changed, that it's protected if, so long as there are other things that, that aren't applicable here, like other land that you could add to it and things like that. And then the next issue was, okay, now you have these non-conforming lots. Are they fixed in stone forever? Are they, are they just what they are going to be forever? And so they developed this process for, um, for making changes to non-conforming lots and non-conforming structures. And um, they used this finding mechanism. But the way the cases have been decided over the years, uh, the courts have basically said, well, we're going to let cities and towns, we're going to require that there be some mechanism, but we're going to let the cities and towns decide how stringent those mechanisms are going to be for each individual town. And so that's how we got to where we are today. And so what we're debating is just how stringent do we want to be in Northampton, um, you know, with uh, the non-performing lots in town. And that's, that's the question we, we have here. Carolyn, um, much has been made of the fact that Northampton's unique in this regard. I don't think that's the case, but unique in the, and uh, Solicitor Seawall, you may know as well, uh, what are the protections that we afford people in the process? Uh, now, we've heard from one neighborhood about one particular project that they felt that they were not protected insofar as the decision that was there was a decision rendered by the time the project was withdrawn, so no one really knows how that process may have played out, although there, there was not uh, clearly not comfort with the way the process was going, nor the people doing the adjudicating, but... Um, well, I mean, other uh, decisions that had to be made when the 75 Act was passed was, who's going to make these decisions? And, um, the, and, and the legislature decided that citizens are going to make these decisions. Not trained professionals, but citizens, you know, people in the community. And so that's how we got to having these zoning boards and planning boards staffed with or membered by people who are just like the rest of us who may not know anything about zoning or to come in and make an evaluation the best they can. The protection that they get is notice, the opportunity to be heard, and a decision by an unbiased decision maker. That's due process. That's the essence of due process right there. And so they get their due process rights, but the, but, but the decisions are made by lay people. And that was the determination that was made under the Zoning Act. And, and you know, would they get a better decision if we had trained professionals as our planning board? I don't think so. The same would hold with the CBA. Right. The Zoning Board of Appeals is also similarly. They're not paid professionals, they're volunteer citizens who are by appointment. It's also worth noting that the planning board is, while you may describe them as lay people, I, I, every planning board that I witness, every iteration of the planning board actually uh, contains an area, a, a, a representation of expertise that you're not going to find if I were sitting on the planning board. Well, that's right. That's because the appointing authority has made a point to do that. But not everybody, not every community does that. You go out into some of the smaller communities and you're going to find people who have no concept of zoning and have been chosen because one of three people who is willing to do it, and that's the only criteria that there, that there is. Uh, and zoning boards are discretionary. I mean, they're clear, they're clearly our guidelines, but there are discretionary decisions that can be rendered in the course of that. Whereas neighborhood input could be taken into account, even though zoning something is allowed, there's an opportunity to say, 
particularly of triggering a special permit, to say no. Um, the, so the pressures, I mean, what I have to take away from the conversation that I heard from the neighborhood, not project specific again, but those are the only people testifying, so, uh, was a concern of lack of protection and oversight from something that would be construed as being dilatory to a, a neighborhood that uh, would create changes insofar that would impact the character of the neighborhood, which is a, which is a really kind of broad description of what, I mean, a swing set could broadly could impact a neighborhood, right, on some level. But so we don't clearly define what the tipping point is. We don't say what is the thing that actually renders a neighborhood wounded. And that has to be an objective decision, not a subjective decision. Obviously, if you put it to the neighborhood, they would say, no, it's not going to happen. That's the end of that. So something you have a board that's supposed to look at this holistically and see if it has benefits for the community or if it has adverse impacts. The and balance the benefits against the order. Right, the competing right. interests in the, yeah, exactly. And that's what zoning is all about because every zoning decision, somebody loses. Every special permit imposes on somebody, almost every special permit. There's always winners and losers in, in zoning. Well, that, yes, I mean, this is the nature of governance and politics. It's the competing, how to balance competing interests. Right. And so that, that, and what are the criteria in which you review? And it's supposed to be, as I understood it, when I ran for office, is the criteria is supposed to be a general good. It's the good for the, and at, at running at large in particular. The argument to that point from uh, Attorney McLaughlin is that this basically renders everyone proximate to a non-conforming property similarly vulnerable and unprotected. Now, the the, as, as Carolyn, as you have presented, the, the principal non-conforming properties that this would even become an issue with are principally located in the downtown area that evolved as opposed to a product of planning. Doesn't sit on square lots, doesn't sit on, I mean, it, you know, started with a goat path and became what we call fondly Northampton. So there are, there's a myriad of non-conforming systems here that would be more concerned. As you go to the outer wards, it's less so. It's if you're up uh, Ryan Road and on, on uh, Bird's Pit Road, although I have to I take that back. A little one on that. So, but there is, the likelihood is mostly concentrated in this area. And in fact, actually the subject of virtually every hearing that we've had tonight uh, was essentially conforming or non-conforming or trying to make accommodations and adjustments for um, an antique system that evolved as opposed to uh, in trying to create planning and zonings as such to facilitate, which I think we've identified as our objectives, which is to increase density, and I can speak to the issues about people opposing the density here at first, but to increase density, uh, walkability, uh, to lower impacts, uh, expression of greenhouse gases and so on, and also to expand affordability, which is, we're very limited in our capacity as to what we can do about that. We can create zoning, that's it. We can't, there's no rent control. We're not allowed to by constitution in the state of Massachusetts. There is, we can't seize privately held property and, and compel them to sell or rent at what we would consider a reasonable and affordable rate. We can encourage, we use more carrot than stick and provide opportunities for affordability to be developed. Not all projects are affordable, but they have to be governed more or less by the same rules as affordable projects, as I understand, right? They have the, Unless the ordinance gives bonus for affordable, but... But those are incentives, that's right. Yeah, so the, the, the prohibitions are uniform. The, the bonuses, the, the incentives are embedded, so. Okay. Um, we, on this issue, 
this is what I will own. I will own that I have no way of knowing what non-conforming properties would be impacted or not, other than the one that has been held up as an example. I don't know, and, and when, when I talk about impacts, the impacts that we've sort of described are not unique impacts, by the way. Parking, wetland issues, uh, uh, noise possibilities, uh, character of neighborhood being affected, um, that, that comes up in every, every proposal. <coughs> there is not one that I've ever witnessed otherwise. Oh, and property values. Um, first, I want to say uh, there has not been a single project in the city of Northampton that and I've looked, and I've done some research on this, that has been adversely impacted as value goes. In fact, usually the complaint is the values climb up too high, and affordability again becomes the pressure. And that's actually our biggest problem, is the desirability of the city of Northampton, people wanting to move in, they pay higher prices for the homes, they pay higher prices for the rent, as much as the market will bear, such as it is. We're very limited. We're really limited as to what we can do to manage and control that. And zoning is the mechanism by which we do that. So that, I own that part, but at the same time, I'm also, my, we vest an aspect of trust in the people that have worked for the city and actually have a proven track record, um, who have always performed in good faith and with good work. And that includes the volunteer boards that work for the city. Um, and yes, I think there is at times, I mean, I'm admitting my own ignorance in some cases. We don't have, we're not blessed with uh, people who have a full, comprehensive understanding of these things, which is why we have these meetings, these public meetings, so we try to vet it. Um, in my time serving here, I'm certainly aware of wetlands issues, wetland buffers. I'm, I actually now can identify various zoning uh, codification that, that I have no business knowing, none. I don't understand why I do. <laughs> but that's, that's the nature of how we govern ourselves. So I want, and the pressure here for us always is to make the right decision. Mm -hmm. the, and actually that's not even us, on us here right now, actually. That comes later when it comes before the council we vote on. Our pressure is, do we say to the council, we think this is a good idea to move forward. We're not sure about this. We send a neutral recommendation. Or, hell no, this is stupid. Don't do it. And they can, and by the way, the council can completely ignore whatever we say. But this is the last stop before it goes to the council. What we decide here does not become law, does not become policy. It is merely a recommendation to the council, just so everyone understands. And also, the principal part part is to provide an opportunity for a hearing, public hearing. We've had two on this, basically. And public deliberative process, which I'm subjecting you to right now, and I apologize. So, um, so my inclination is to forward this with a positive recommendation. Uh, Councilor McLaughlin, we have closed a public hearing, but do I, you have I know it. I came in and saw you making questions of the city's representative. Yes, the, she serves. She serves this body as well. I'm not. I'm not turning okay. you down. I'm okay. giving you an opportunity okay. to speak. But the, your, the parameters are different than they are when they were in the hearing, yes. because we're in the deliberative process. And, and yes. I and, and um, you have the right to ask clarifying questions of whomever you'd like, and so right. you've done that. I, I would address. A clarifying question to you, but I don't know what the question is you want me to ask you. So well, you, you let's presume I asked it and you go ahead and answer it. How's that? <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, I'll, I heard you reference four things that you found to be particularly important in this decision, and that was increasing density, increasing walkability, greenhouse gases, and affordability. If I recall. And I just think that there's no positive to vote in favor of doing away with the findings on any of those four criteria. As for the greenhouse gases, as I said, fourth, what's going on here is 
They're making the greenhouse gas situation worse because they're building huge buildings I'm without sorry. the park. I'm sorry, but now you're debating me. So I mean, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. And I understand. And I understand your point. We actually, and it's it's worth speaking to. Actually, the issue of greenhouse gases and trying to reduce greenhouse gases over the city, and also permeability, with the stormwater runoff, sure. uh, pressures on infrastructure, and all those things. That actually is why we do density. Because the, the superior infrastructure systems are located within the downtown area and within this proximate area that we're talking about. As we build out exponentially outside, those pressures increase because we don't have that infrastructure and, when, and it, it is not up to date and it, is, it isn't designed to handle this capacity. Greenhouse gases, regardless of whether people have cars here or not, you actually heard in another hearing where a couple who had bought a house proximate to the deuce are willing, they walk and bike, and that is their ideal, and they would prefer to do that. I also recognize not everyone's going to bike. Not everyone's going to be as conscientious as you, and, and it's also a seasonal participation. Yeah, and, our, and, our, and our mass transit system is, is woefully underserved. We're woefully underserved as far as that goes, and that's, that's on the state. But the fact is that those competing interests also are once beyond our, our realm of influence. We want, at this point, to increase, if we're going to have increased development in this city of any sort, and there is no stasis, as everyone seems to acknowledge on both sides, then we want to control that density, we want to keep it locust in this region, and we want it where it will do the least harm, if, if you will, and some of the harms that you described. That's the, that's the argument for density. I understand your case, and I don't disagree, actually. I think, actually, uh, unfortunately, there always is an increase in automobile usage, and it's, and um, although that may change after this week, who knows? I mean, we may all be walking around with skins and moccasins, but as for the time being, this is what we're dealing with. So, and I'm sorry, and I don't want to debate right. you, I just wanted to respond no, okay, to your well then, I, you know. I could go on and on. And, I, and, I know. And I just don't know what is the cognizant argument for density for density's sake. Not density for density's sake. And I didn't, I, in fact, right. I don't think I made that case. No, but I don't no. hear the argument for density. Okay. Can well, I ask you a question? Yes, yeah, absolutely. I'm here. Um, I'm here. So you said that basically the, the crux of your concern is with our parking lot. <coughs> absolutely. Right? absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, because I don't think you should touch your finding and you deal with your parking. That's the 800 pound in the room. You answered right. my question, thank you. Uh, other questions and comments about that? Thank you, Councilman. Yeah. Okay. And the um, issue. No, I'm sorry, go ahead, uh, no, I, I, I certainly held for it way longer than yeah, you should have, so I'm sorry. Yeah, this is, I, I hear what you're saying, Alan. I, 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 and I think, you know, maybe in our sustainable plan, it's great to be aspirational, but maybe it's a little disingenuous to say no detriment to, you know, and we will not be detrimental to uh, neighborhoods. There's, as you say, there's a, there, there's, there's a sub certain amount of, of you know, negative uh, repercussions. So I see that. But, I, you know, but I'm also, you know, hearing, ironically, it's kind of gone to the people who probably know more, back to me, and I will admit that this is not, this is all new to me. Uh, but what I see is reasonable concerns from residents, and um, those those concerns not really, I, what I'm hearing, not really being addressed uh, in the process. Um, I'm wondering, uh, a clarifying question about Councillor um, Thorpe, what, uh, how he began um, our deliberation. What does it look like? Are you saying that you can come up with an alternative amendment here? or? No, there was an alternative that was presented, and that's actually um, that I looked at. Yeah, okay. And I just didn't know if that was something we had to bring. No, we, we do an amend here or amend on the council floor. Okay. It, it was an option, so okay. I did look at that option instead right. of just uh, totally throwing it out, you know, off the table. But, okay. um, it, it looks reasonable, and I'm not, a, you know, I'm not opposed to um, the the um, this going forward. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I'm considering um, the option that was put out to the council and that's listed here. Uh, requiring a finding with a detailed review criteria for the zoning board of appeal for parcels that do not otherwise trigger a planning board review. You know, 
So being very specific on that. Yeah. Carolyn, do you feel comfortable uh, describing the two alternatives again that you were proposing as a possible amendment? Sure, and, and the other thing I would say before I do that is that um, if you all vote as a body that you wanted to see um, a language of that sort changed, I could have that for um, the council meeting, so you have something in writing right. going into that meeting. But yeah, if you um, could just sort of break it down with um, other councils. Sure, you. so, um, you know, one alternative would be um, to, uh, in, so as it's written now, um, changes um, would be allowed by right, that's the proposed language. Um, and so the, an alternative would be instead of that, changes to a new conforming use that meet other criteria in the zoning could um, be either uh, move forward with a finding by the zoning board um, that addresses that non-conforming element um, for those projects that don't um, also trigger a planning board review so that you wouldn't have overlapping or duplication of review. Um, sort of the next level down would be um, um, a, a finding for projects that reach a certain threshold that might still trigger planning board review, but um, um, so in the case of a residential use up to six units um, of new development might go to the zoning board and then also because of other criteria in the zoning that are already there and not being discussed um, would trigger a planning board and then another a third more sort of um, I guess um, even further overlapping jurisdictions would be um, to have it go to the zoning board no matter what um, I would definitely recommend, in addition to any other permit, um, I would suggest that once you get over a project of the scale that would trigger a special permit by the planning board, that you know you could also charge the planning board with review of the nonconformity as it relates to whether it's substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. So you could essentially sign that review process to the planning board so that you're not creating two separate boards reviewing for a project that's of a certain scale. So that's another way to also think about it. I envy your um, your knowledge on this. When I, when I read your thorough answers today, I was uh, really humbled by the complexity of, of this. And it's really, to me, as I said, not really about this ordinance needing to change. And um, trying to really picture what smart infill looks like. And to me, that's kind of dealing with the kind of real world, um, frankly, the pushback we're getting from the residents. Um, and that not being the only, the only factor, but that that has to be there for me. Uh, um, <coughs> this is not to discount any of that. Right. But you will, we will visit this again. We will be visited by every proposed project approximate to any neighborhood or anybody is met with resistance. Yes. And I even understand the specific resistance and concerns in this neighborhood. And in fact, they're not unique in, that, in many respects. Uh, these same pressures exist. I mean, sometimes it's cold comfort to realize that when these projects, when and if they do pass, move forward, that the subsequent concerns start to abate afterwards. And the, what was originally thought to be detrimental to the neighborhood turned out not to be something else. But as you heard, uh, Claudia Leto actually talked about her opposition. Her opposition to the Lumberyard was vehement. It was vehement because of the detrimental impact that it would have on her neighborhood. And suddenly discovered that that was, it didn't have the impact that she thought it would, and it impact actually expressed. I won't speak for but you heard what she said. And interestingly enough, she said it in opposition of the zoning change, so. Um, well, I'm not looking to shut down the, the amendment. Right. Um, so I think at this point, um, should we just talk about how we're... Well, what we can do, if that's your pleasure, we can ask Carolyn to craft, you, which you guys got to pick door number one, door number two, or door number three. Um, 
but have asked Carolyn to uh, craft an amendment that can be introduced on the floor. And we can actually make it a condition of our motion that, you know, say if we voted the affirmative, conditional upon uh, the language being drafted and delivered to the body. So, whatever your pleasure is. So if you want to talk about the three options and the pressure is there, and, um, I, I, I know which one Attorney McLaughlin <laughs> wants. <laughs> and, that's, and that is up for consideration. Uh, Sister Seawall. All right. I'm going to ask you a question about all those three options you have described. What is the one that is most fair, just, and efficacious to uh, use as a process? The process is going to be fair, whichever of the three you choose, because there is going to be notice, there's going to be a hearing, and the, those who support it and those who oppose it are going to be heard. Uh, uh, to my mind, anything that is going to a special permit, I, I mean, they should. I don't believe there should be a finding because it's it's uh, kind of a waste of the zoning board's time because all of these issues are going to be um, heard in detail in the special permit process. I think that's a fairly easy one. Um, with regard to, um, and I just want to also point out that we are only talking about projects that have some form of nonconformity and would like to change to another permitted use that complies with all of the requirements other than the deficiency. This is a very, very rare occurrence. I have never in 35 years filed a zoning appeal on a finding. I have never done that in my career. I mean, this is something that these neighbors have experienced and, and, and the reason that the only people who are here are from Dewey Court is because this is such a rare that's not occurrence. True. It is a very rare occurrence. Earlier, I've been no, practicing thank you, please, please. Discuss. I have been practicing land use law for 35 years and findings have never been an issue. They are routinely granted because they are such a low level of scrutiny. They are just a low level of scrutiny. And that and, and so it's rare for a finding to be denied. I will admit that because of its low level of scrutiny. So maybe that's not the best option of the, the doors, is what I'm hearing. I don't know what that option right. is. I mean I mean either you're gonna have no finding, you're gonna have a finding, which is generally what happens. I will admit that generally findings are you know, towns just go with findings. Um, but what, but I think the reason the planning office has made the recommendation is because this is the ultra rare occasion where there is a, a non-conforming lot, but the expanded use conforms with everything else other than the existing deficiency. This is a very rare occurrence, and um, you know, and if we had discovered this other than in this particular project, this there would never have been a question. In my view, there would never have been a question about this. Because it is, you know, that's just. That's the point, right? I mean, that's. But you've heard from one very, very rare occurrence. Well, that's why I think it is reasonable. I mean, I think what Carolyn has proposed is reasonable, but I think it's disingenuous to not, to, to not look at the real world repercussion. Um, of, and when I when I said pushback from residents, I really should have said what I see now. Now it's been thrown back to my little corner. Is reasonable pushback? You know, reasonable concerns, not just any pushback. Um, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, though, that either way, I mean, what you're doing is, is setting up another public process. It's not that there's no public process. Not everybody likes the outcome of the public process, but that doesn't take away from the fact that there is a process by which people can be heard. So I, I think that's why you're sort of splitting hairs at this point is, should you add two public processes or just have essentially one public process? So. Um, you know, I think that's really on, um, and by adding sort of another one at a, at a certain level that um, might address sort of come to a, a middle ground on it. But, um, you know, that's, that should really be the focus as opposed to what the outcome might be based on a whole a body evaluating the issues that are in front of them. Thank you for that. 
part, part of this comes, which also makes this unique as specific to Dewey Court, of course, is uh, Council McLaughlin said in public at the council meeting and also it was his first introductory statement in, the, in our first hearing was that he, had, he doesn't have a case if this, he's asking us to craft a law specific to a case, which makes you feel really uncomfortable. Um, we're damned if we do and damned if we don't. Because the, um, in, in which has always made this difficult for me with this neighborhood in particular because there was a case pending. I, it, it constrained me in my conversations with uh, the, the neighbors. Um, I had to basically do my own ascertainment. But prefacing it by that introduction suddenly redefine the landscape, if you will, pardon the pun, but to say that what our decision, we cannot base our decision on the prospect of somebody else winning a case. That's not how you craft law. You don't make law in order to facilitate one thing or another. You're trying to craft law that actually serves an entire community. And it's not specific, which is why I've tried to emphasize over and over again, it is not specific to this case. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that's it. That, that is that is been brought up over and over and over and over again. It hangs heavy in the deliberation, obviously. It, it has an effect on all of us and how we consider and where, our, where you witness our reluctance. But the fact remains, at least for me, that it actually does holistically make sense. It has a holistic community application that benefits at least the uh, conditions and terms that I subscribe to. So that's just me. And I don't speak for the other counselors here at all. But the fact is that, that uh, I do believe it has a holistic benefit as opposed to the description that has been kind of hyperbolically push that this is the ruination of, or uh, potential ruination of everything in every community in every neighborhood. I don't see that. I simply don't. So, the, I'm hearing, and Council Sherry, you have not weighed in on this, but I'm hearing door number two, I think it was. Seems like, I mean, for me, as long as any additional um, review process we, Add isn't unnecessarily uh, duplicative, right? I mean, I, I, or it, it seems silly to create two sort of like or exact processes in two different bodies um, if that's not necessary and will just complicate things. But, uh, you know, I'm open to it, but I don't think we want to create unnecessary work for the ZBA if it's not going to have, um, if it's not going to add something to this process. Afford real protections. <coughs> Better said than I think. Or the equivalent of blowing smoke. <laughs> Do you think it's the equivalent of blowing smoke? Adding, the, adding that level of protection? For, for me, you know, I, I see this in a completely different way. I mean, it's like, like the development is a maze. And this is the door you have to walk in. The finding is the door you walk in to get to the maze. Right. Okay. That's really what this is. It's, it's, as I keep saying, it's a low level, very low level of review. And what I think that people are asking for is just two bites at the apple. Yeah. They can see whether they get the CBA to turn it down. Or if they can't do that, they get the planning board to turn it down. It's one more bite at the apple. That's, that's and, and, you know, and I can understand that if there's no other review, of any other board, I can understand why you might want to impose a finding. But for my mind, if, if the planning board is going to be doing a detailed review, it, it, it does seem to be duplicative and it seems to be unnecessary to me. I don't get to make any of these decisions. Yes, no, I, I know you just described a version of Dungeons and Dragons for us. Uh, the, when a decision is rendered, it still can be appealed and it can be actually even challenged in court. Oh, we know because Attorney McLaughlin appealed the finding, and that's why we're here. He appealed the finding, but could he appeal? Could he, with the same strength? Any decisions made by any board 
There is an appellate route. And, uh, which is what's from. Okay. No, I agree. I mean, I think, I mean, I don't know if anyone would disagree with me, but it sounds like the, the reason for the ZBA element is to actually have just one more shot when you feel you haven't got any more shots left. Amy, I'll ask you then what? What? Because the ZBA part is a law, and it's spe in speaking about frontage, and I'm not just speaking about the need for, I'm sorry that that, because that's the sort of trigger point here, but this, there are other developments. There's a development that's already going on Holly. There's now something that's going to go on Wilson. There's something that's being talked about right. on Amden, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so it's not, and I'm not. I don't think it's the ruination of Northampton, and I don't, you know, that's not. A but character. please speak to, speak to the point but about to the, the zone. point about the ordinance is a law, and it's for us in this case, and in many of the others, it's other neighbors who were here earlier who don't live on Dewey Court State, is that the frontage issue. We're not talking, you know, the other things are not part of this, but the, the frontage issue matters depending on the size of what's being built there. There is, it, it, there is a difference between having, being short 10 feet on frontage when somebody wants to put in two houses okay, so you're, versus you're a big building. And I'm or sorry for interrupting, but remember, this is by special request that right, I asked you, ask you, so, so we're deliberating. So your concern is the frontage issue? In this case, yeah. yeah no, but and I mean, in, in the case of the these, zoning that we're describing, is the frontage issue? That's one of them, yes. But it's the it's a primary it's one primary. for the okay. size Thank of you. them. Thank you. Thank you. So I just wanted to add that what I have what I've heard isn't and I, there's lots of different opinions here, but isn't really that all residents want to shut shut down and you know, multi units there. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing specific concerns. And maybe dreaming a little bigger about what smart info looks like and, and kind of uh, thinking what really is the best thing for them, for the city and that neighborhood. Um, and I understand that we're constrained by that. We can't just sit here and dream up our, you know, our ideal. We're not developers. I understand that, but I think we can kind of hold that while we think about this. Well, it's true, and uh, essentially that's what informs the discussion of zoning, depending yeah. to the extent that you can influence it, and you can't, and require or restrict it. I mean, there are other communities that go the opposite direction of where we're trying to go. Um, and work very hard at that. I've become very nice gated communities where people want to live in gated The issue of zoning, of course, is separate from the issue of the Zoning Board of Appeal issue. And, the, and the, so that amendment would not satisfy at least Amy and I get the sense of more people in you know, Dewey Court. But right now, I, I don't know, if, I haven't really got a sense of the temperature of the room, so I don't know, but the, what we're discussing is uh, adding an element of a finding from the ZBA, which is not going to address your frontage issue, to be honest, but, the, but making an allowance for uh, short frontage in specific cases with specific criteria. Um, what was the threshold about the six units? Is that that's the same kind of process? Six units, and, and actually, Councilor Chair can speak to this better, actually, as we did the zoning changes. When, uh, and, um, she was the author of the one that actually had the affordability wow. element built into the, into the zoning law. So seven plus units triggers this, okay. this larger um, process or this more um, comprehensive process. So, so when we're talking about under that seven plus, um, that's where I I don't want to speak for anyone. That's where they're looking for that that extra level of scrutiny. I think. All right. What's well, up? I'll be honest. I'm kind of torn between. I mean, the job of legislating matters is, I learned this from uh, Council Murphy, is to take care of business and then, you know, to really, to really vet the process and send it on to councils. You're not sending some messy, un, 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 uh, researched right. topic. So, um, that said, I would, uh, I could, I, so I could kind of see 
we could talk more about positive recommendations with the stipulation, or I could um, be neutrally recommend and therefore spark more discussion when we have more uh, eyes and minds of our very smart fellow counselors. I, in a sense, I feel like it's a little bit of passing, passing my burden to them, but because it's such an important, um, you know, obviously important issue, I, um, those, that's where I'm kind of going, if you want to know that. Well, sending consolation, we always pass the burden on to them. Oh, that's, that's our job. That's what we're supposed to do. I mean, it, it, why we're not allowed by our rules to kill anything in committee. We don't act like the legislature. We pass it on, but as you said, we, we do a deeper dive. And uh, that's what all subcommittees are for, is just to give counselors an opportunity, at least somebody else who has experienced a broader conversation about it. And because I, I, you know, I am new, so I'm just kind of looking no. at both those options. I just want to be honest about I, um, I, I'm that. grateful for your honesty. <laughs> honestly. I really, yeah. Um, okay. I have heard... So, right now we have a motion on the floor for approval, to send this forward with approval. There's also a discussion of, with a conditional discussion of adding an amendment, door number two. Um, but I don't know if it, but in, based on your vote, if you vote, and let me describe this, if we vote on this as it is, an I vote moves it forward, a no vote, depending on the majority, if the majority votes no, it goes forward with no recommendation, and or if it's split, a neutral one. Does that make sense? Door number two again? Door number two is, well right now, Councilor Sherry, you put it on the floor originally, right? Yes, I did. So if another council wants to propose an amendment, and then see if, if uh, Council Sherr is prepared to accept that as an amendment? That's what pro was proposed as no members of Council No, just as as written. As she... Her, the original the motion put it on the floor for deliberation. So, and it would be an amendment to, to what is um, before us. Does that make sense? And then that would go on to be recommended or to the Council vote. at large. And then debated there and voted right. there. Right. Um, not Regard yeah, vote. as I said, regardless of how this pans out, yeah. it goes to the council yeah. for for discussion and debate. I just didn't know if we would vote then. Well. The council would discuss both the amendment as it is now and our suggested alternate, which both be we we, discussed and discussed. We can. Uh, Laura can attach a note. Whatever. I mean, uh, I prefer to have it go forward as an amendment just for the for cleanliness and clarity's sake, if that were to be, but. Uh, let me, Carolyn, you'll be able to draft some language for us by the next council meeting that would be. Yeah. Uh, so depending on what the amended motion is. Right. Um, so I, you know, I heard um, you saying a motion, door number two, would just be for a finding in front of the zoning board with, uh, for those projects that don't also otherwise trigger a planning board review. Right. Right. Okay. It's it. Okay. That would be, so that will be uh, Councilor Thorpe's motion, and then we'll need a second, I, provided you're okay with this. Okay. Would you like to second it then? Okay. All right. Setting it forward with a positive recommendation is the motion, with the amendment that will be drafted by uh, Carolyn that will uh, require a finding. ZBA um, for the specified triggering uh, um, proposal. So you still don't want to vote yes. So you still I guess it's hard without the amendment, for, you know. But it's just a recommendation, I suppose. Right, right, and that, and that, and if you want, I mean, that's still going to be discussed on the floor as well. Do you want Carolyn to go through what would trigger that finding, or what would help you? No, that's okay. okay. I think I think I got that. Okay. I've just heard also that the finding isn't really a, doesn't really offer the 
the kind of checks and balances necessarily. There's no, yeah, there's not, there's no mic drop item that we can put in this. If, and if we didn't, the law would stand. If we didn't, that's one option too. If, if there's no recommendation, it doesn't pass the council law, the current rules stand. And this, uh, this change does not occur. So the proposed change is that, that before it will not occur. So that's another option. But not, I mean, that would basically reflect a, a, a no vote, I think, if there, of the body. If the body would vote no, that would be their, their recommendation to the council. Don't move on this, is what they would say, basically. What, who would say? The, what we would we, say. We would say. We're if we say if we say no, no recommendation, right. we tell the council to leave things as they are, don't touch it. Right. And they, as they said, they still can tell us to go pound sand. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Right. So. May I verbalize my go for it, the yes. motion that's on the floor, please? Go for it. Um, that you're moving to make a positive recommendation with the stipulation that you're making the request of the OPS planning department right. to submit language for an amendment that would require a finding for projects that don't otherwise trigger a special yes. permit? Is that what you're saying? Or trigger planning board, planning review. board yeah. review. Yes, the, the yes. That's, the right. that's, that's how you start with it. <coughs> Any further discussion on that? Uh, we are deliberating. If you have, um, uh, uh, I mean, there's a difference between special permit and planning board review. So you, you might want to clarify that. Yeah, yeah, there is. There is. Okay, I understand that. All right. So it's there's site plan review. Site plan review. Permit. Right. But thank you. Any further discussion? A second, too, because um, Councilor Thorpe's motion. Uh, Councilor Sheriff, second. Yep. All right. All those in favor of advancing this as amended with a positive recommendation to the uh, Council, please say aye. 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 I would like to go down as, as a neutral recommendation. So you can say no. No. So okay. could I say no? I don't want to go down. No, no negative. work. It's fine. It doesn't matter what the, the vote well, will reflect. The negative the and neutral. I want to say neutral because I want to have a discussion. Well, here let me let me explain to what can happen. Is you you voted no. Yeah. The vote uh, when Laura sends this forward to the council on the agenda will indicate a divided vote. Right. You have an opportunity to explain your concerns right. or what it was. It's not saying that you're maybe not. I I don't want to project what you may be thinking, but the fact is, yeah, you get. I have Not a no or maybe you get a yeah. I so you're hour. I have lingering concerns. Um, I think that's perfectly appropriate in your vote this way. And since it's not the final vote, I think I'd like to take time to speak about the Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. All right, so that moves forward with a positive recommendation with the stipulation for the amendment and with a three to one vote. Moving on to the agenda, the next item given. I look at the body, I look at the audience here, and I see the other issue was the one I leapfrogged over too, so if everyone's comfortable with that, unless, is there someone here um, for uh, the zone change for Wright Avenue? Okay. So we'll go to uh, the issue, we'll skip to item B, Laura, 20.004 for rezone nine Con Street parcels from neighborhood business to central business. Councilor Bell, I don't mean to disrupt in any way. I just have a need a point of clarification. Sure. In a previous meeting and a previous interaction we had, we were told that we were you, you were told you could not talk to us about these issues until the matter was completed in hearing or whatever. It's not yet. Are, are, it, if, if you it's vote only now, complete. are you allowed to talk to us now? It, it's in this case no. And this one, this one's because it's it's because it is complicated in so many ways. I can talk to you after the council vote. That's when I can talk to you after this vote. No, because I'm still I'm a deliberator still beyond this point. So that's my concern. So in general, when there's an issue that the committee doesn't want to, that, talk, I don't know. When there's not a legal case pending or pro, uh, possible in the case, yeah, I can talk about anything. And in fact, as I think I said to you in my letter, I'm actually, I can talk to you about it. I'm erring on the side of caution. I'm not disallowed 
Uh, they can't constrain me. I, have, I do have the right to speak. But I'm erring on the side of caution because of the possible litigious issues. And I, that's, so it's a choice that I make. But any of the counselors can speak to you any time about any subject. And, I, and I'm just feeling constrained in that way. That's, so that's why I, I demurred when you asked. So I'm sorry, we gotta get back to this. We gotta get back to business. So this is, uh, I'll accept a motion to put this on the floor. Move the recommendation. Second. Second, okay. Um, discussion questions on the rezoning of Con Street to central business, uh, these lots to central business. Um, can you close the door, please? Thank you, Steve. So, Carolyn, I do have questions relative to some of the points that Council Murphy brought up, also issues about impacts on this is unique in some ways insofar as that there are residential neighborhoods embedded with traditional uh, two or three story frame houses that uh, you know you heard one pe person speak about they're concerned about the property some at some point uh, being subsumed by uh, central business and then thereby rendering their first floor unusable for residential so can you can you talk to those yeah so um, I believe there are only two residential structures within this block of proposed lots that are uh, for consideration to be rezoned to central business. Those uses would be able to continue um, to be residential um, without any problem. Um, we actually currently in central business do allow residential uses on the second floor and in the rear. So it would really only be the front portion of a unit that would be considered non-conforming. Um, as I mentioned previously, oh, so those can remain. The other residential um, properties that people were concerned about future changes, of course, would be subject to future right. hearings. Uh, what we've talked about in terms of the form-based code for expanding central business coming down these two corridors is really to allow much more intense residential use even on the ground floor as a mechanism to support commercial growth and expansion. So I think once we look and finalize the form-based code, even those residential, current residential structures within these blocks that you're considering now, um, the plan is to allow ground floor residential when we make those changes anyway because this is a portion of the central business district that doesn't have the same kind of intense um, pedestrian vibrancy right. that we see on Main Street. So the issue of having ground floor residential isn't so um, important to making sure to uh, support that. So um, as it relates to just these blocks, yes, right now they would continue as allowed non-conforming uses. The, how, uh, to Council Murphy's concerns about the oh, uh, the design, design. Yeah. yeah. So actually, in the central business architecture design standards, they are very um, they only apply when you're making a change to a structure, the external exterior facade of a structure, and there are provisions spelled out. For the, uh, different structures are classified by their architectural character. So there are um, um, design criteria that are um, specific to what we call transitional residential buildings, which is what his building is. There are design um, applications for what we call anomaly buildings, which are basically all the other structures. I was going to say everything. In the, yeah. Everything else except for the other two residential buildings that are in the, um, those blocks would fall under the category of transitional residential or anomaly and they're treated very differently than what we call um, theme commercial which is the kind of street facade that you have on main street or of course we have a different category for um, um, 
uh, lost the word, for um, those specific buildings that um, are like the Academy of Music that are standalone structures. So those are the two other types of classifications that we use. So there already are built-in mechanisms to address the different styles of architecture. So you don't share Council Murphy's concern or, or the, I mean, <coughs> Because as he points out, along with central business comes the existing central business design standards that apply to Main Street, for instance. Right. No, I, I think because of the way that it's differentiated based on architectural style, that um, there are provisions and allowances. And actually, it's a lot more flexible for those types of buildings than it would be for modifications to a theme commercial building. The, um, now, of course, this is another one that was kind of project specific. And again, the project that kind of triggered development of the zoning discussion now. Um, the, I don't know if everyone's up to speed on what actually has occurred. Essentially, um, and correct me when I'm wrong, which will be frequent, I'm sure, but the, uh, there was a service club. Service clubs enjoy the use of different licensure under the state of Massachusetts ABC's new rules. Um, everyone presumed that no one had any reason to think that um, there was, this would be no different than just a simple transfer of license transaction. And there was no reason to assume otherwise. But it turned out there is. This is, uh, this is a, a different qualifications for the licensure or different qualifications for how it's identified as, as opposed to a service club it went to a nightclub which is only allowed in central business is that correct right so it's a land use and zoning classification which is different from a licensing classification right. so that's another complicating factor and um, I you know I think it probably it's my understanding it morphed a long time ago. The, the, uh, the club did get a special permit for a restaurant use um, back in 2011. Um, so at that time, I think they were trying to correct and come into compliance with zoning. And, and it hasn't really functioned truly as a restaurant um, either. And again, it's just, I think, the circumstances around um, trying, to make it, trying to allow it to function. Um, but yeah, so it, it has um, um, a muddled history as it relates to zoning. <laughs> I mean, this is, I mean, every issue we're discussing about, again, once again, it's just sort of how things evolved as opposed to how things were the result of what so. Um, so the, the two of butter concerns I heard expressed or the change in zoning would adversely impact their quality of life. They didn't argue about the detriment to the neighborhood necessarily because this has been the case in the neighborhood already. So it's something that they, I heard express concerns, they didn't want to see an expansion of it. Although, and it's a valid point to say that these are the owners for now, but we don't make the rules for the owners for now. They That's right. Could be another owner who will go unnamed, but who was alluded to, that could do something else. Mm -hmm. That could be noisy, less less well patrolled, less compliant. More days per week. Right. Um, yeah. um, but the fact is that there is already sort of intensive activity that's located in this whole area, that, and that actually will be another issue on Wright Avenue that we'll be discussing as well about parking pressures, uh, uh, consumption of mind-altering substances uh, that, that might inform behavior or at least congregation of people in an area that that affect what the folks who are actually in the middle of this is, is still harbor some sense of that they're in a neighborhood as opposed to a business district. And I, and I can understand that desire for sure. So, 
but there in the zoning to uh, central business, there's no exceptional protections that we can afford them beyond what's already allowed. Right. I mean, things that are ancillary that apply no matter what business district it is are um, things like the noise ordinance. Right. So that's still applicable, and so complaints could be made to the building department. And the the um, measurement is taken at the property line. So even if it even in today, if if someone had a complaint about noise. Um, they have a valid complaint to make to the building department, and um, the property owner would have to come into compliance. Um, Steve Connor, may I ask you, it's a two o'clock license? It currently is, yes. And it's full liquor? Yes. May I ask a sure. follow up question to that? So, with the licensing, I mean, if, we, if, we're, if the concern is this could be sold to another business, uh, they would have to go through the licensing process all, all over it. again. All and that is another kind of... Oh, there's, there's, yeah, right. should it change hands, right. there's there's a number of points. It's just that what's what's allowed and not disallowed under the zoning differential, the differential. so that's, that's what we're... At least that's the concerns that I heard expressed. I mean, as to issues of Liquor bottles, those tend to be nip bottles, and I would blame the liquor store nearby more on that than anything Thank you. else. Yes, and scratch tickets and everything else. So my lawn looks like. So, <laughs> but it's they're not allowed to take bottles out of the venue. They're not allowed to do that. So um, smoking's a different issue, and that that would have to be up to the um, the business owners. So just so you know, we had the outside smoking. There. Up until a certain point, they're not allowed to bring any drinks out there to hang. Right. They go out and smoke right. after a certain hour. Yeah. I mean, it's conditional to your liquor license. You can't leave with any alcohol and beverage out of your hand. So. Are there other questions? Those, those are my questions. Uh, Councilor Thorpe and Councilor Shara? Will the capacity for the venue change? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Um, so there are other things that come into play, building code primarily, and I don't know anything about the building code except for enough to um, say that it exists. And there, it is possible that interior renovations would um, allow a change in the total number of patrons, but that triggers, um, you know, other code requirements, fire code, as well as bathroom facilities. So that and right so um the capacity is really going to become a building code issue there have there are no plans to expand the footprint which then would trigger other land use code requirements and reviews but anything internal to the structure is all going to be dealt with by the building department and the fire department thank you um so the 32C-131, it says um, neighborhood business portion only. Is I'm just curious, is that the little, is that the one on Wright Avenue? No. So that's the one that um, it, it actually is where the dialysis center is, and there's a it's one single property that includes webs, but the uh, rear of the property is zoned office industrial. So um, it's always it, well for many many years it's been split zoned that part property in particular, where the Pond Street facade is neighborhood business and the rear has been uh, industrial. <clears throat> so that includes the rental center as well? I don't think that's on the same parcel, but yes, the rental center is office industrial. I don't see the, I, I don't know if you can see the property lines. I mean, it might include that. I just can't remember that off the top of my head. But the rental center is in the industrial portion of the property. Yeah, it's hard to say. GB is stamped over it, so right. I can't see it. <laughs> um, other questions? Um, prepare for vote. Prepare for vote. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, Carolyn's description of kind of the protection <coughs> of the home for the pre existing residential uses that are there, I, I find heartening. 
and this is what, as you said, you already spoke to this at some level, and that yeah. you're confident that this is doesn't necessarily apply to Council. Council Murphy has means of uh, <coughs> redress or protection from having. Because I agree with him. I don't think I don't think the central business architectural design requirements make sense down at that end of Con Street. Yeah. Um, yes. So the so again um, for um, there are a lot of changes that you can do to a transitional residential structure that are just a staff review or just go right to building department. Um, the kinds of things that would require a central business architecture review would be if you wanted to board up a window or if you wanted to take a porch off of a structure. Um, if you're adding an ADA ramp, this came up actually on Gothic Street just a couple of weeks ago. The Central Business Architecture Committee reviewed a ramp to um, uh, meet ADA compliance. And it was a very straightforward um, review. It's really more about making sure that ramp fits into the architecture of the building as opposed to just throwing up you know, um, a galvanized steel ramp in, in front of a building. Um, so there are, and in fact, there were um, several other aspects of that project that would go forward, but the only one in re for review was the ramp and then a, a modification to the porch. The committee approved it because it, under the um, review of it as a, a transitional residential structure, and therefore um, the proposed uh, modifications really were about how to map, how to blend those new things into the existing residential structure, as opposed to saying you can't do a porch change because it doesn't look like Main right. Street. Um, does this apply to things like someone wants to get put new windows in or vinyl siding as opposed to uh, clapboards? Is um, so new windows, if they match with, if they look like the windows that are being replaced, then that doesn't go, that, for any building, anywhere in the central business district, that just is a staff review. So it doesn't matter whether you're one type of structure or another. Um, uh, siding. It depends on what the existing, so if you have clabbers and you want to put vinyl siding, um, gosh, I'd have to look at the guidelines. I don't know. That, I mean, that's definitely in a new, in new construction, the committee has definitely discouraged vinyl siding. But um, in terms of replacement, I have to check on that. I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, it's usually um, what the rather than paint sometimes that just go with vinyl side. It really has to do with whether you're changing the look of the building. So if your vinyl siding matches exactly what the clabbers look like, then you can do it without review. So it's not just the silhouette, it's actually the facing, the face shape. Right, so if in your slathering a building in vinyl, you take away those are those details of the trim boards and the fascia and the um, window sills then that's a visual change in the structure so that would trigger review by central business however if you were to do vinyl siding the um, way that i think um, is also available and is a better way to do it by keeping the trim or creating vinyl trim that matches exactly those depths and offsets that are existing, then that wouldn't even require a review. And these reviews would not, these properties would not be subject to this otherwise, it, only because they're now being considered now right. being part of central uh, business. Of social business. Right. Any other questions? No? Um, and just to clarify, sorry, for anomaly buildings, the standard is even lower. Right. <laughs> um, a butler so, building is not going to. Right. So the only th um, provision there would be if, again, if you're closing window openings, 
because the idea is to keep vibrancy on the street. So if you're closing windows that are facing the street, that's going to trigger a review. But if you're opening, um, if you have an anomaly building and you want to make more windows, um, that's a buy right. A lot. You don't even have to go to the committee for review. So um, there, there are fewer triggers for review for anomaly buildings, which um, are the other buildings along the corridor. The non-residential building. Right. All right. Uh, the motion is to move forward with a positive recommendation. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 What, what's that? That's not an answer. Yeah. That's, I mean, I, you know. Do you want to abstain? No. Do you want to vote no? Do we have to do this by process of elimination? <laughs> <laughs> Three taps. <laughs> I'm tired and, um, no, it's fine. Do you want? No, we can. I can kill the vote if you want to. If there's still questions you have, I'm sorry if that was. No, no, no. Um, I don't. I don't have questions. I'm just not sure how I feel about it. Then vote abstain or vote no. As a, All right, I'm not done. Okay, there we go. All right. A little off awesome means it's good for some. <laughs> that's that's what I like. I like that it's kind like of pushback. Right that's I how like we. Stay. That's, like, that's yeah. how we get it done here in Northampton. It's, uh, Believe it or not, we hit the end of the agenda. Oh, uh, really? I'm, like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There's an opportunity. There is one more vote, and that is uh, I'll accept the motion to adjourn. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Was there a second? Aye. Adjourn, by the way. Second. Yeah. You don't get a vote.